All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Oye, oye, welcome to the first uh, Smart Cities and Service Improvement Committees of uh, 2020. We're, this, we're officially now the most innovative city in America. <laughs> we did it. All right, roll call. We have a quorum. We have uh, Vice Mayor Jones. We have Council Member Jimenez and Davis in the back. Um, review of work plan, nothing. Consent calendar, nothing. Straight to reports. Go ahead, sir. Uh, great. So good afternoon, Mr. Chair, committee members, members of the public and city staff. Dolan Beckel here, Director of the Office of Civic Innovation. Joining me in the box is Deputy City Manager Kip Harkness and Smart City Manager Reginie Nair. The agenda for today, which you can see on the upper left screen, includes our standard Smart City Roadmap update. Uh, second is an update on the launch of San Jose's new digital front door, the city website. Third is an update on spatial data integration, which unfortunately is not an update on outer space. And last is an update on the first net migration. Uh, so in addition to a dose of healthy infotainment, uh, a common theme that we're gonna see across all these updates today highlights the successes and challenges in cross-department collaboration for citywide technology projects. This is a trend that will only increase as we leverage technology and process improvements in our digital transformation. These complex, at scale, citywide projects do deliver significant positive impact to our community, but remain challenging to execute. And this is a critical skill for which the city needs to continue to develop. Uh, having said that, I will now turn the presentation over to our smart city manager, Reginie Nair. Thank you, Dolan. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee and public. My name is Reginie Nair, Smart City Manager for Civic Innovation. So just a quick recap of last year, uh, back in March 2019, we uh, unveiled our very first base, uh, or unveiled the updated Smart City Roadmap, which identified 30, 38 high priority projects. And as you recall, every six months we refresh our roadmap. And, and uh, last fall we identified 49% or 49 projects. Uh, and by December, uh, many of the departments were able to accomplish green status, which we were able to achieve 73% 73 at that time. So during that break, uh, there were 10 projects that were identified uh, to be completed. Um, they essentially graduated from our roadmap, and they will no longer be tracked for status. So these 10 projects that you see with the yellow stars, those are the ones that will be removed from the roadmap. So adding on those 10 projects to our victory list, uh, let's take a moment to uh, admire our accomplishments over the past three years. Uh, the good news, uh, these numbers will continue to rise, and ultimately the goal uh, will be to have established metrics to measure our impact and assess areas we need to further invest to improve our services to our community. So keeping with the tradition, we refresh the roadmap again for spring uh, 2020. Uh, removing the 10 projects that I mentioned before that have graduated, I added four projects from a backlog. You can see what's uh, uh, dashed in, in boxes. Uh, so now we have a total of 42 projects on the Smart City Roadmap. And for the month of February, there are seven projects that have changed status and are circled for your reference. So the first one is privacy strategy. That changed from yellow to green. Uh, we now have officially a senior privacy lead, uh, Sarah um, Papazagloskis. Sorry, I'm going to apologize for that. Uh, transportation events tracking is the e-tracker project. That changed from yellow to green. This project is on track and the Department of Transportation is currently incorporating uh, the Verizon traffic data services uh, pilot um, and that is moving forward. IoT reference architecture, that changed from green to gray. This is on hold until we hire an IoT lead. Um, as you all recall, Keshav Gupta was our previous IT lead and so we're currently in that process for hiring. Uh, first net deployment, this changed from green to red. Primarily, we're in a need of a product owner uh, to uh, lead the citywide effort. Um, the next one is the Silicon Valley Regional Communication System. This changed from yellow to green. 
uh, the tower at Coyote Peak is now complete and now city staff is currently testing and training uh, to use the equipment. Community Wi-Fi, this uh, has changed from green to yellow. Um, it has been delayed in developing a community Wi-Fi strategy. However, we're in process in developing a pro forma that shows 10-year outlook of both capital and uh, operation and maintenance costs um, in order uh, to evaluate all our existing and future deployments that we're planning throughout the city. Um, this effort is in partnership with the airport, information technology, and public works departments. And the last one is Dahlia Affordable Housing Portal. This has changed from green to yellow. Uh, this project is still in uh, negotiations and has impacted the schedule uh, to onboard a vendor to begin the work. But I did get an email, so I think things are going back to green, so we're moving forward. All right, so looking at our progress from last fall to now, there is a slight decrease uh, in our progress towards green. Um, the bright side, these bar charts uh, really reveal the complexity of delivering any innovative project. Um, and as identified in the tech deployment audit, uh, you know, the importance of using Agile, having a governance structure and a dedicated team, um, and also these monthly reportings, it really helps us quickly reveal and alleviate any roadblocks that prevent these projects um, from moving forward, so in ensuring their successes. So on the next slide, I will share the latest update on the remaining red status projects. So for my San Jose, uh, currently it's red because the team is still pursuing the change order for the language translation, uh, and it is anticipating to go now to March 2020. Um, also, the team is in progress confirming the scope and approach for the My San Jose 2.0. This project has been delayed by 12 months. First net deployment, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're still, uh, we're in process to find um, a product owner to um, manage this project, um, but also the pilots that have been utilized, that, that's also extended beyond the anticipated schedule. This is currently a three month delay. So with our Unleash Your Geek uh, program, we were, we were successfully able to launch it on December 11th, 2019, in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Technology and Innovation and Startup and Residence. These challenges are currently being advertised and we will conclude uh, the proposal request until this Friday, February 7th. So anybody listening, last minute invitations, please send them. Uh, also in parallel, uh, we are launching the um, Innovation Learning Lab uh, in our partnership with our Human Resources Department, where it will help us in our mission in creating a new generation of innovators. So currently, the status of all these new Small Wonders projects, are, uh, or Unleash Your Geese challenges, are green, with the exception of the unmanned aerial systems for emergency response. Uh, this is in partnership with the fire department, and mainly it's because they have received a, a grant opportunity um, in collaboration with the uh, city of Mountain View, and so they need to go through the process of filing the grant and then also securing a contract before they can uh, start the challenge. So keeping another tradition that we've been doing last year, uh, we wanted to highlight the good innovative work that many of our teams are uh, doing and in our Green Spotlight series. So today I wanted to recognize the Climate Smart Task Force team, uh, which is led by Ken Davies and the Environmental Services Department. As we all know, uh, San Jose is committed to Climate Smart and to the American Cities Climate Challenge, um, which both focus on the uh, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Nationally claimed for the city's adoption of the REACH Code, which focuses on the removal of natural grass from new built environments. San Jose was one of 25 cities awarded uh, resources under the American Cities Climate Challenge through Bloomberg Philanthropies and is the only northern city in California that received this opportunity. So that's kudos to the team. And this is a $2 million grant that helps San Jose be ambitious in achieving our goals in the Climate Smart Plan. The team's accomplishments include the following. Extensive community outreach efforts to various communities with uh, an equity focus 
uh, citywide. ESD uh, constructed the carbon-free living trailer to educate residents and building professionals on zero net carbon homes and technologies. Major building energy policies are currently in place. The Climate Challenge website platform launched in three languages, and uh, the e-mobility roadmap is, uh, was adopted in council in, uh, back in January. Uh, currently, the Climate Smart dashboard, that's in operation, and uh, the team had an opportunity to present to our Smart City Advisory Board, and they were just so, so excited and really eager to help out with the city and in advancing our um, desires. So this collaborative effort uh, is across several departments. So I do want to recognize uh, it's Environmental Services, Department of Transportation, Community Energy, Planning Building Code Enforcement, Public Works, Office of Economic Development, and the airport. So I want to take an opportunity to congratulate the team who are sitting in the front row. I think most of them are. Some might be scattered in the back. So, so thank you, team. So then the recent news, uh, the city of San Jose is the recipient of two SMART uh, 50 awards for projects under the category of digital transformation, which is uh, the business tax amnesty project. And the second category was under urban operations, which is our very own centralized emergency vehicle preemption project. Uh, these projects were competing with several projects internationally and were recognized by the Smart Cities Connect, uh, Smart Cities Foundation, and uh, US, U.S. Ignite, and uh, for being the most innovative and influential work. So congrats to Finance Department, Fire Department, and Department of Transportation teams that are involved. So now I'm going to pass the uh, mic to Kip to do the honors for the next few slides. Good afternoon, Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager. Um, if you are a public radio listener, you know this is Pledge Week, and so this is our version of Pledge Week here. So we're going to interrupt our programming for a moment uh, to ask for your support. Um, so uh, uh, one of our leaders, uh, Dolan Beckel, has been nominated for IoT Leader of the Year, which is a very big award and also representative of the work of the whole team in addition to, to Dolan's uh, leadership. And so there's an opportunity to vote him up. We have a nice little bit.ly, um, which is at bit.ly slash vote San Jose and I can't believe we got to that bitly before uh, those of you on council did because it's a really good one um, but uh, if you could if you could go there and start voting him up so that we can make sure that he wins the the finalists that would be great um, so that's that's the end of pledge break we'll go back to our regular scheduled programming now uh, with a couple of transitions Kip, question. yes sir we attach that bitly to a tweet is that what we do sure yes please or, or, or do we just use that as a URL to actually go vote? Uh, you should go vote, and okay. then you should attach it to a tweet. I got it. Okay. <laughs> I know, like, we're not Chicago where we vote early and often, but maybe we should. Uh, if, <laughs> test it out. See yeah. what you can happen. Okay. We, as we know with, with technology and, and elections, it's uh, here and hit and miss. So yeah, we'll see how many times you can caucus. vote. Yeah, here yeah. we go. Okay. Thanks. All right, uh, and then uh, next slide, a little, bit, a little bit sadder, is to acknowledge some transitions. Um, one framing I'll give on this is that uh, one of my uh, leaders that I look for in how we think about career growth is Reed Hoffman and the work that he's done in, in the book called The Alliance. And one of the things he talks about is that more and more we're going to see people not sort of sitting in one place forever, but doing tours of duty and then doing another tour of duty, moving on and changing and shifting their roles. So I wanted to acknowledge uh, two very uh, important uh, leaders in our organization, Michelle and Erica, both of whom are taking on new tours of duty. Michelle, who has been instrumental in giving us digital services that are easy to find, easy to use, and accessible to everyone, is moving on to a private sector role where she will be tackling working with technology at the federal government level. So we'll be very interested in having her come back in about nine months and, and see how happy she might be to come back and work with us, but uh, to give us a report back out on what that is like. But she'll be taking a, a role um, helping the federal government look at some of their systems like uh, Medicare and Medicaid and improving the user uh, experience there and beyond. Erica will be uh, taking a tour of duty with the, our own internal IT department and stepping up into one of our Super 6 
pro, uh, product project manager roles, where she will continue her work with the development services team uh, with, an, uh, at this time, a permanent assignment to make sure that we deliver the development services at scale in the way that our customers expect and need. So I want to acknowledge both of those transitions uh, with a little bit of sadness, because they will be leaving the innovation team. And both of these women engineers are founding members of our innovation team and are really the um, spirit and the pioneers of all of the work that has come after. So thank you very much. And I believe that concludes our presentation on the roadmap, and we are happy to take any questions uh, or direction that you might have for us. Mayor Carter. Thank you. First, uh, congratulations, Dolan, well-deserved award. Uh, and sad to lose Michelle. Is that literally a temporary nine-month assignment, or is it? She no, that was me speaking. Hopefully, she's oh. she's taking a full-time gig uh, oh, and a very significant you? leadership role. I see. Well, of course, we know uh, great bright people are going to have great opportunities. So, uh, Michelle, we're sorry to lose you because you've been so instrumental, and I know you were here at the very start when we tried to launch this whole smart city vision. And really appreciate everything you've done to help us get on. On a, on a great path. So thank you for your service. And Eric, I'm glad we still got you uh, somewhere in the organization. So that's a great, that's a great thing. Um, so I just want to check in about a couple issues. Um, one is the evergreen, my San Jose. <laughs> um, I just want to understand, we're going to finalize the scope for 2.0 uh, in March. But that would mean then the, the work would start in March, is that right? N no, so, um, uh, Mayor, I think several committee meetings ago, you, ca you actually asked us to take a step back uh, and kind of look at delivering My San Jose in general. Um, one of the things we are very close to doing is evaluating uh, whether or not the best answer for the city is to continue to build on the existing platform mm -hmm. uh, and or or uh, go through a 18 to 24 month procurement and build on a new platform. Um, we are very close to making that decision. There's a few uh, uh, discussions we're having with our vendor. So we are confident in the ROI on the existing platform. Uh, and then in backlog, we have the language translation and the recycle plus. So we are literally having a discussion with the city manager this evening, and we are very close to making a, a decision on the path forward with that. If we move forward, basically that is My San Jose 2.0. The original concept for My San Jose 2.0 was to introduce language translation and to have a scalable platform for introducing products and services. Right. We had a very rigorous architecture review about a month ago that included Oracle executives, um, uh, Google executives, and the vendor, AST, as well as our tech team. Uh, and the conclusion was there's a couple things we need to work on, and if we work on those, we do have a scalable platform. So uh, our hope is is that we'll be able to come back to you at the next committee meeting and, and give you a, a positive update uh, on our direction, and we'll be making that decision in the next two weeks. Okay, so just to understand clearly, don't if by scalable platform, that would suggest then if we continue to stay on the horse we're riding now, that we'll still be able to expand and include new features um, to address the many things. I know we've all been saying, hey, can we add this? Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. There's a very large pent-up demand. Yes, there uh, is. And so our, our, goal is, our goal is three things. We want a strategic partnership with the vendor, right? So we're focusing on outcomes and not just, you know, incremental uh, uh, deliverables. The second is we want to be able to introduce new features such as language translation quickly and then we want to introduce new services quickly. Um, the architecture review identified that of these two things we're, we're negotiating a get well plan right now if those two are fixed we should be able to both introduce new features and new services quickly. Okay great and then the community Wi-Fi um, I was informed that We've, we've really moved off the path of believing that um, there's a value exchange model here. Is, is that right? Um, uh, I, I can, it's, it's confusing. The short answer is no. We actually just expanded the, the, the domain of the value exchange model. Okay. So if originally we had a value exchange around 
our rooftops. And I know you brought up some suggestions about maybe looking at city easement on new buildings as well. Uh, w after that, we discovered within the scope of what the original RFI was, there was an interest in an exchange on advertising. And so what we've actually done is we've just expanded <laughs> the complexity of the value exchange from what we originally thought it was going to be to what was still within the scope of the RFI. That's just taking longer. And the other thing we've done is dug a little deeper into the reality of where our infrastructure is and where it would need to be to deliver the level of service that people are expecting. And so it's a, it's a little bit more complicated and it might be a value exchange plus uh, in some areas. Okay. And we'll come back with uh, both through the normal council process and through the budget process with a more complete understanding of that as we flesh that out so that you can understand what the decisions are that need to be made there. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we move on, we have one public speaker, Mr. Beekman. Would you like to come down. Hi, everybody. Um, I was uh, with the, uh, you're going to have the unmanned uh, drone uh, project uh, in, in working with Mountain View. Um, this was, uh, I think, possibly a Bay Uwasi project uh, of a year ago, a grant project. Are you going to be working towards better public policies with this? Uh, it would be a good time to try to introduce that again. Uh, thank you for mentioning it, mentioning it here. Um, about the cell uh, Wi-Fi issue, um, they've just recently placed a 5G, I think, over on the corner of 7th and San Fernando, and it's uh, right in parallel with a third-story building, and it really brought to my mind that, uh, you know, with what you just described, it really leaves open the possibility that you're going to not be considering the public at this point and, your, and the health of the public. And with your, your private partnerships that you're developing with Verizon and, and others, uh, how can we all work together towards asking for better public safety? Uh, I hope you can work on that issue, and, and, I, and definitely something we'll be all thinking about in the following months, uh, I hope. Um, congratulations that as a city uh, government, you're, you're going to work more interdepartmentally with issues. I, I heard you say at the beginning. Uh, that's hopeful to me. I mean, my ideas of accountability are always really uh, exciting. That I, I think it's the accountability issue ideas that can really connect with the different departments and then connect to the community. And when, once you share that excitement with the community of what you're learning and growing from, it's infectious and the community will want to be a part of that too. And, um, you know, I th uh, good luck in your, in your efforts. Uh, to, to do that, and, uh, and about IoT, I have a few words about IoT, uh, that, uh, uh, that open accountability is so important, it needs to be mentioned in, in Dolan Beckel's uh, application in the future. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I also want to commend the team and Michelle and, and everybody on the hard work that you've been doing, and Michelle, I've been on the private sector side, I've dealt with the federal government, you will be back. <laughs> um, I just want to uh, ask about uh, completed projects. Uh, I'm just trying to wrap my head around the concept of a technology project actually being completed, and what exactly does that mean? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I, th I think... <laughs> Is our technology projects ever complete might be the question, but w what we have is what we're, the rigor that we're going to continue to enforce on an increasing basis based on the tech deployment audits is the completion of the scope of the project charter. So managing this project charter, the scope that's within it uh, from, from that reporting aspect, from that citywide reporting, citywide governance, citywide standards that was talked about in the tech audit uh, two weeks ago. Uh, that project charter defines a project. And when that project has achieved its goals uh, or its re-baseline goals uh, based on scope, 
then that constitutes a completed project that may not and be the end of a product line or a program but it's the end of a completed product project based on the project charter and the only nuance i would add is that for us the road map is is the short list of the most important change efforts so once something is is to back to us a business as usual or a relatively stable business and as usual which may include iterative updates it can fall off of the road map if we feel like it's it's uh, under control and able to be handled at the departmental level or the, at the local leadership level. So it's not that it's done done, but it's not that w now something that requires the focused attention of the larger team to make sure that it's moving along is the hope. Uh, next question. Um, in the uh, technology audit, uh, one of the recommendations or um, observations was all these projects that are at the, the department level where there's no visibility to council or committees. Is there a plan to bring those projects to this committee or other committees? Or what, what's the, um, the strategy in terms of uh, addressing that uh, particular observation and recommendation? Yeah, so we're, we're thinking through the right way to do that. That obviously has some governance impact and some reporting impact to the different committees. But the recommendation and the commitment to do it is there. And it was two full, It was kind of a people process technology. Um, are there tools that allow us to better document roadmaps and communicate them? And then what's the process? What's the right committee uh, and frequency to bring them? So the short answer is yes, we're going to do it. We haven't worked through from with the committee leads how we would actually do that. And that's what's in the administration response that, that's going to take us several months and why those were yellow lighted um, efforts. Thank you. All right. Um, I had questions, but they're related to, to FirstNet later, so I'll wait for that. But also, just congratulations, uh, and the best of luck moving on. We'll, we'll miss you lots. So thanks, Michelle. Uh, just a quick uh, gut check. I'm told that we're going to lose quorum pretty quickly. Um, I think the, the mayor and vice mayor have to go by, what, 430? Is that right? 3.30. By 3.30, we're going to lose Council Member Jimenez by 3. So is there anything that we need to kind of make sure that we get cleared? Anything we need to take out of order? We can just keep going, but try to go quickly. Yes. So processing that real time, um, uh, I actually, since there were questions about FirstNet, since uh, emergency response and preparedness is one of our top priorities, it might make sense to fast forward through there so you can see why a red project, how, well, why did the green project go quickly to red and what are we gonna do to get it back? Yeah. Uh, especially since this is citywide. So I think what I would ask is if we can forward to item four, the first net, and um, if those people are here, um, we can get started. And I see they're here, so we'll be able to do that. So. Uh, Chair, I'm assuming that you yes, will do please. whatever we need to do to, to make sure we can move forward to top of four. Okay, great. All right, so I'd ask uh, Andy, Ryan, uh, Ray, uh, and other Rob to come down. So uh, this second update <laughs> for today is about our, our first net migration. Uh, the work started from the learnings of past events where we uncovered to need to optimize the city's communication uh, during normal uh, first response activities during emergencies and disasters and allow those people to access both voice and data in the field. Uh, capabilities such as maps, uh, in-field data collection, uh, applications, et cetera, that can be again communicated through voice and data. So to share an update on the FirstNet deployment, uh, welcoming to the box uh, next to Kip, Andy Smith, who's the Police Department Interoperability Manager, um, Swati Ganesh, who's the IT Product Project Manager for this project. In the back box, we have Ryan Doolin, Deputy Director from the Fire Department, and Rob Lloyd, our Chief uh, Information Officer. And as uh, we transition the slide and Andy gets started, I will point out that there are a number of people presenting today. This is their first time in front of council or, or committee and their first time presenting. So um, we want them to have a good experience so they want to come back. <laughs> Andy, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Dolan. Honorable Mayor, committee members, city staff, and members of the public, Andy Smith uh, from PD. Uh, so much for having an hour to prep in the audience before my item comes up. <laughs> So here we go. And you can be rough on me. I've been here before. Um, 
We embarked on the first net investigation, if you will, or started to look into it uh, well, almost two years ago, and, uh, at least from the police department standpoint, and then we moved into uh, collaboration with um, Civic Innovation as well as collaboration with AT&T. We've done an extensive amount of testing and we continue to do that. We like to trust but verify. Uh, that's how my boss likes to, to take care of business. We see the, uh, the immense value in FirstNet in terms of not only public safety, but public uh, works and other support uh, departments within the city. FirstNet will ensure that we have the best possible experience on cellular broadband, whether it's a congested environment or not. And it also will help us communicate during times of disasters, large scale incidents, um, and those kinds of things. <clears throat> we have the ability to increase our priority on the network. It's called an uplift tool. So we can uplift um, certain parts of public works with public safety and OEM or, uh, or everybody at once. So that we'll, when we are in a congested area, we'll have the, the, best, uh, the best connectivity options. Um, one thing to keep in mind is FirstNet is a, a broadband solution, not necessarily a radio solution. So it's very complementary to the new radio system that we're, we're rolling out and we're in the middle of rolling that out. Um, hopefully the police department's six, eight weeks away and fire's right behind us. And um, so they are complementary. They're, they're never gonna replace each other, if you will. So um, slides are back. All right. So um, one of the benefits of the citywide deployment that we've undertaken with council's approval is um, every, every first responder and uh, primary and extended users are gonna be on the system and have access to it. And uh, we've got quite um, a good partnership going in terms of uh, the mass uh, discounts, if you will, on, on the service as well as the, um, as the devices. So um, as we roll this out, we'll be able to position ourselves for uh, optimum communications on the cellular network. And the other thing is that it's, we're not just handing out new phones or a phone, we're handing out a smartphone that's gonna have uh, many different capabilities to it um, in terms of real-time data collection and real-time data sharing. Um, it has mobile data management attached to it to not only protect the city's network, but also to protect the integrity of the data that is on the devices. But we will also be able to um, push information to folks in the field, uh, maps and those kinds of things during the emergencies. And we'll have the ability to collect data. Um, there's an Esri collector application that you embed pictures with uh, Latin long. And that's exactly what FEMA is looking for for reimbursement pur uh, purposes. So uh, when we're trying to put together a, a debris removal plan or seek reimbursement or seek uh, set priorities from streets to water to sewer to uh, anything that comes along with an earthquake, uh, we'll be able to, we'll be better positioned to do that using FirstNet and the, and the smart devices that we're rolling out. Great, so Swati, if you wanna take over and kind of go through the uh, deployment plan for the next uh, nine months. Thank you, Dolan. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, Mr. Chair, committee members, members of the public and city staff. This is Swati Ganesh here and I'm the uh, products product manager in ITD. Uh, this is my first time presenting and I'm really excited, a little bit nervous, but mostly excited and I hope to be here again. Um, <laughs> the first net rollout started uh, yeah. The first net rollout started in November 2019 and will continue until December of 2020. We have uh, AT&T's best in nation pricing and we want to make uh, full use of that. Uh, the deployment is broken down into four major phases. In phase one, which is from November to December of 2019, we completed our first pilot and rolled out devices for subset of police, fire, Office of Emergency Management, and Information Technology Departments. After the rollout, we engaged in the lessons learned activity with the departments and AT&T. We are currently in phase two of deployment. We have applied the lessons learned from our first pilot. Uh, we, have, uh, we have communicated with uh, departments other than the primary departments in pilot one. Uh, we have, uh, other than the primary departments in, in pilot one, we have till date rolled out approximately around 500 phones. Uh, we are in the process of developing the deployment plans in partnership with AT&T, uh, as well as some guidelines around FirstNet. Um, uh, as, as 
as it was mentioned before, we are also looking to hire and staff a product owner to, to kind of take the leadership role in this uh, whole uh, initiative. Uh, there is also uh, there's also discussions and actions being taken to develop communications citywide. Um, uh, there's, we are also continuing with this concept of war room sessions where we want to actually have, have war rooms to uh, to kind of uh, gather the lessons learned and as well as have at and staff um, on prem in the city hall to to help with any support issues uh, once the once the pilot two is rolled out we we would again uh, gather and apply those lessons learned in phase three of the deployment the phase three will begin sometime in june uh, till october um, and this is basically a mass rollout where we want to roll out all FirstNet devices citywide, and uh, and and we want to use an agile fashion to run this project. And we are and we will be running this in bi-monthly sprints, clearly indicating which departments will be involved, what devices it would be. So so there's so that is under in the works currently. Um, in the third phase, we will also build out secure encrypted network connectivity. The last phase of the uh, project, which is phase four, uh, is, is basically the support phase where we would incorporate FirstNet into emergency management exercises, uh, perform FirstNet operational tasks during emergencies, continue war room support, update policies, and establish governance between departments. And, and lastly, we'll close out the project and, and the budget through up. Great, thanks, Wadi. So this is a point, I think, to stop and uh, address the red status before we move on. So um, I, uh, part of what the tech audit is requiring the city to do is be disciplined. And so in this situation, we're being disciplined. Our original project charter for FirstNet did not actually have us doing a phase two pilot. Um, we realized after we did the limited phase one pilot that we needed to do another pilot on a limited scale. Uh, involve some additional departments and um, and include, uh, in addition to phones, include the vehicle modems because we realized that could be much more complex than, uh, than we originally anticipated. So we inserted this phase two pilot. We basically then compressed phase three and so we basically aren't meeting our dates in our original project pilot, and, and, we're, and that would cause us to be in a red status. Um, the other reason we're in a red status is in phase one, we recognize that the Rob Lloyd and Dolan Beckel being the executive sponsor and the product owners was just not a sustainable solution. So we looked across the city to identify who we could uh, staff as a full-time product owner to rep really represent the departments, but the challenge of these citywide projects is there are multiple departments. Um, we have actually, uh, we're pretty positive that we have a really good solution to uh, who the product owner is, and we're gonna finalize that and communicate with the various departments. Having done that, having had the product owner um, identified uh, and having a, full-time product project manager, whether that be SWATI or another person, we're confident we'll be able to complete phase three on schedule. So the red is a little misguided uh, in some respects. We are still confident uh, that if we get the product owner staffed, we'll be able to complete on time. But that discipline uh, leads us to say that we're red, and if we weren't red, we probably wouldn't have been able to convince the, uh, the, the department, in this case mine, to have a product owner identified <laughs> to, to do this. Um, so we are confident we will be able to get to phase four uh, and complete by the end of the year. The reason we have to complete by the end of the year is that's when our contract, our best in nation pricing uh, ends. So we, we would increase significant additional costs if we don't finish by December. Again, we're confident we'll do so. So by the next update, I should be able to say we have identified the product owner and that person is this person and we have a full-time project manager from ITD and um, we'll be confident we'll be able to deliver. The other thing we did that didn't necessarily cause us to be red was we realized there was some resource contention for the rollout of the Silicon Valley Regional Communication System, the SVRCS, the P25 radio system. That's tens of millions of dollars of city investment that's been delayed for a long time because of that Coyote Peak. So we adjusted the schedule also to make sure that Andy and the police department resources would finish up that project and then move on to this one. So um, probably more sausage making than you wanted to know. But at the end, yes, we are red. If we have the product owner uh, engaged and onboarded, which we have to do within the next two weeks, we'll be able to complete this project on schedule when we're back to green. 
So then moving on to the lessons learned, and there are a lot of them, but I'll, I'll kind of go through, through this fairly quickly. Um, some of the lessons learned from the first pilot and part of the second pilot is we need to select the right tool. Um, we did a lot of usability, extensibility, and durability testing on the phones. Andy and I did what we call crash phone testing on some of the hardened phones to make sure that they would take the beating uh, that the police department has, uh, and we're, we're satisfied with that result. We also learned from other cities and that if you don't have that mobile data or mobile device management on the phone that makes it secure and also allows you to pu push out applications about maps. Where's the collapse bridge? What route should the police take during an emergency? If you don't have that mobile device management, data management tool, the phone is just another phone. So uh, we took a lot of time up front to procure the right software for police fire OEM. And so that one selecting the tool we did, we did right and we're happy with that. Uh, focusing on the user experience, that's kind of the same thing. Creating guidelines, uh, we realize that carrying two phones, which a number of staff will have to do, is a cultural shift. So carrying two phones is, is a cultural shift. And we did not really have the guidelines in place and the communications in place that made it clear when you have to, why you have to have two phones when you use one versus the other. And so one thing that we, one of the reasons we added that second pilot was to make sure we, uh, across the city in uh, employee relations and HR, uh, we have the correct guidelines in place that will inform the final policy so that people understand it better. So it is a cultural shift to carry two phones, but it's necessary because one phone will work when there's an emergency or disaster and the other phone will be overloaded. Um, and then finally on managing resources, obviously the lesson learned was um, from a, from a product ownership perspective, we need a, a committed product owner in the role, uh, not Rob and I. And we also need a full-time project manager. So we're taking that time to get the resources in place so we can scale quickly for those remaining uh, June through October and, and deliver on schedule. Um, I believe that uh, gets us to the next slide, which is kind of where we are. So uh, this is, uh, we're, in, we're in the phase two pilot. As Swati said, I mean, we have delivered over 500 phones. Uh, so we are, you know, we're about a fourth of the way through the phones. And we are also doing a pilot as we speak of installing the, the technology in the vehicle modems, uh, in the vehicles, so that their, um, their communications devices in the vehicles also work. So um, we're continuing to move along. We're in phase two, and we will move to phase three in June when the radio rollout is complete and we have the right resources in place. So that concludes the update on FirstNet before we lose quorum. I'm gonna turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to public comment, Mr. Beekman. He's gonna pass? Okay, great. <laughs> Do we have uh, Council Member Davis? Thank you. Can you go back to the last slide, the previous slide? Um, this was really helpful. I appreciate it. I'm curious about the what the guidelines are going to cover, and then um, what the war rooms are for. Yeah, good, good question. So um, the guidelines are going to cover when you have two phones, um, what <laughs> Case, case in point, uh, what, what you have to use, when you use the business phone and when you don't, and when you use the personal phone and when you don't. So what's a, what, what is each device used for in context of city activities? Uh, it's gonna cover a time frame by which you need to have your first net phone on and available versus not. It's gonna cover uh, policy on what's called the stipend, where some employees are receiving uh, a benefit from the city to have a, a city-issued phone they previously were using for personal purposes. Uh, so it's really gonna have guidelines around usage, uh, uh, benefits, uh, and uh, emergency management usage and requirements of that person with that FirstNet phone. Yeah, and, and more clearly communicate not only the whys, but some of the what's on this phone. The, the MDM, the mobile device management, or the mobile data management, which is standard practice anywhere that wants to have security over its mobile devices, has not been something that we've had. And so this, this phone is much more locked down and much more secure, and 
folks in Rob's team know what's going on on this phone in a way that they don't know what's going on on this phone. So it's a cultural shift and change. And so we, part of it is the explanation of that, of why, why it's so important that we have a greater control over your device. And part of it is uh, the ability to, to kill this if it gets lost, the ability to change and update it um, as we're uh, on the fly and add applications in in the middle of uh, an emergency and also location tracking and a much more robust security and ultimately encryption. But those are very new to the organization and that sh the phones are so personal to us, we realized uh, we needed to take more time to explain and lay out those shifts in a formal policy. And then your second question was on a war room. Um, we're going to be, <laughs> I, I didn't, I, I guess I'm dating myself with that term because that was my term. So we're going to be setting up, we're going to be setting up certain times and certain days and certain locations where AT&T, uh, ITD, and other city staff will be available for any uh, employee, council member, staff who are having issues that can come in and just say, I tried to do this, it's not working. Or this, and so basically it'll be a, a, a kind of a, a customer care center, a physical customer care center, where uh, people can come to get help with their first net phone. Okay, thank you. And the uh, over 4,500 devices that are deployed, is that all full-time employees? I mean, it's that's a lot of devices. Who's right. not getting one, I guess, is right. not that, So that, that, that's a valid question. Um, and it, the, the memo does lead this out, but at a, su at a summary level, um, there is two categories of FirstNet users, and this is defined by the federal government. Uh, one is called the, the, the primary responder, that's police, fire, and emergency management. Then there's the extended primary, and those are anyone who would be involved in responding to a disaster, managing a disaster out in the field, to manage the disaster. So we want to be able to have, for example, uh, pu public works employees who are out fixing bridges to be able to be in contact with the EOC director or with the police interoperability director. So it's this concept of primary and extended primary. Uh, and then the device count is a combination of phones, so a combination of the, the smartphone, uh, hotspots, so existing laptops, uh, for example, could attach to the hotspot that's able to use this band 14 reserved network during emergencies. So smartphones, hotspots, uh, some departments have actually tablets that they carry out in the field, so they have tablets that will operate on band 14 during the emergency, and then the vehicle modems for police and fire, to, uh, fire trucks and cars. All of that together comes to 4,500 okay. devices. Thank you. Mayor Licardo. Uh, for those of us who would rather not have two phones, is there an option just to pick the more secure one and stick with it? Yeah, there there is an option uh, that comes at a cost, so the cost benefit is limited. Um, but we can, on an exception basis, figure out how to manage that. We can take existing phones and swap in a, a different, like a, the SIM card, right? Like you're doing for some of your uh, um, leads, right? Yes, so the short answer is we probably can. Uh, it's more expensive. Understand that the relationship we have with, with uh, FirstNet through AT&T is right now the iPhone 10 and the Samsung are costing us 99 cents. This wow. sims, this, right. So the, and, and the unlimited data rate for primary respondents is $30. So unlimited voice and data. So we have the best pricing in the country because of this citywide relationship uh, that we, we negotiate as part of our public-private partnership. Assuming it's a compatible device, and I don't know what device you own, Mayor, um, uh, is we, we can get a SIM card, hmm. but that SIM card comes at a much higher price than 99 cents. Right. So I think we, we can manage that on an exception basis. One example okay. was we already have some police chiefs who carry three phones. We didn't want to add a fourth one. Yeah. So we, we, in those situations, we got them a, a compatible SIM card. So there is an option. We just have to manage the cost of it carefully. Okay, I, yeah, I didn't want to be a pain because it created a lot of exception. I was just trying to figure out for those of us who are... <clears throat> We have a hard enough time just keeping track of one phone. <clears throat> I can't imagine with two. And, you know, if we did have one phone, you know, are we going to get in trouble for playing Fortnite? Uh, you know, 
this can still be used for personal. We tested that, and the MDM does not allow you to download first no Fortnite on your first net. I see. All right. Okay. Duly noted. Um, but uh, I think Andy had uh, Andy from the police had one additional comment on that. I do understand that there is a special skin that comes with the uh, Note Plus that uh, you could probably download, but you just can't play the game. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it and look forward to seeing it all roll out. Thank you. Thanks, Dolan. So I, I guess my question is more about the capacity issue. You were saying about how no one's kind of in charge, or we, we were lacking resources. Uh, not that no one's in charge, but like it's, it's shared responsibility among different um, silos, I guess. So what are we doing to make sure that there's somebody who's the point person, primarily responsible, that we can blame and, uh, <laughs> and praise uh, as necessary? Well, there is, there, there, I, there is a point person. So I am the executive sponsor of FirstNet. So ultimately, I'm accountable. I'm the person you get to blame. Mm -hmm. um, what we were missing was the day-to-day, -day, this is our goal for this week. This is the goal for the next two weeks. This is what we have to achieve. Oh, you've got an issue. I'll help you unblock that. Uh, in my role right now and the size of the staff I have, I can't single-handedly do that. That was the missing role. So Rob Lloyd and I have been kind of dipping down and, and helping SWATI and, and the departments execute, but that's not a sustainable solution. So the sustainable solution is I'm accountable, I'm the product owner, I'm, I'm the, excuse me, executive sponsor. We're identifying a product owner who's very familiar with broadband and the AT&T relationship uh, and, and telcos that will help drive this, and it's a known commodity to the departments that we hope, hope is acceptable. And, uh, and then SWATI, who is now about 50% committed, we need a full-time product project manager, full-time, and whether that's SWATI or an additional person. So that's kind of the whole governance structure. Sometimes we talk about one versus another, but this discipline we need to uh, interject into the city around tech deployments, you need an executive sponsor that can make decisions, manage resources, and fall on their sword. Uh, the second is a day-to-day -day product owner to drive the team, and then you need a project manager to keep track of all of those dependencies, issues, status, et cetera. So that's what we're putting in place between now and June, and uh, I'm pretty confident that we've got a really good structure in place that we'll be able to come back next month. Okay, so we're trying to innovate, and, and every time we unveil something new, uh, or just, just beyond what we're currently doing, whether it's an updated website, or a My San Jose app, or you know, in the future, you know, autonomous vehicle pilots, or, or anything else, uh, this first net thing, um, there's always going to be a need for a primary responsible, like dedicated day-to-day -day handler. And I guess, being the thinnest staff city hall in, in the country for a big city, um, and when we go doing our budgeting for just you know one time, one year spending only, we, we can't keep creating permit roles. But to the extent that we keep innovating, um, I mean, does it make sense to structurally have somebody to kind of? Uh, be the overwatcher, overseer of, of pushing out future deployments and such? Well, I think what you're going to see come back with the tech deployment audit response is a, a holistic look at that governance structure, right? We, it, the way it is, if there's a tree in the forest, we crash into it. And so the first tree we crash into is we meet, need more product and project managers. Now we're crashing into the, okay, we've got that, but now we need the product owner to, to on a day-to-day you know, -day basis, drive that team. And you know, next month we'll hear about the business tax amnesty where Rick Bruno was a great product owner within finance. Uh, how do we replicate that for cross department? So we're gonna need to build product ownership muscle. And then we're also gonna have to identify executive sponsors and make it clear what is an executive sponsor? What, do they, what, do, what does accountability mean? So uh, I, your point is well taken. I think that we have to look all the way from the executive sponsor all the way down to the project team, and there's some muscle that we're missing, and what we're, where we are now is we're missing that product owner muscle. Okay, um, sounds good. Can I get a motion to accept the previous two reports, D1 and D4? So moved. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. All right, great. Moving on to D2 or D3? What's uh, I suggest we move on to D2, all right, the, the city D2 website. Then. Good afternoon again, Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Mr. Mayor, and members of the public. 
I'm very happy with this next update, which is the release of our new city website. Building a website is, of course, no trivial accomplishment. It requires a dedicated it requires a dedicated team, time, effort, and investment, and an almost obsessive understanding of the user to get a launch successful. I think in addition to this, uh, this wasn't just a website update. This was a real stretch into a digital front door where we are delivering services in a digital manner that's easy to use, easy to find. And to be honest, we had under-resourced this project at the beginning. We treated it as a kind of a, a, an easy peasy website update when in fact it wasn't. And so uh, we were a little late in coming to that and understanding it and building the team around it that it needed, but we did that. And I'm proud to kind of introduce that team and let them walk through the results of their good work. So joining me in the box for this update are the people who did the real work. Uh, Rosario Niaves, who's our Director of Communication. Matt Opsel, who is our Senior Executive Analyst on this. Michelle Tong in her last presentation to us as a Digital Services Lead. And Apoorva Pashrisha, who is the Technology and Innovation Advisor to the Mayor. So Rosario, it's all you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. I'm Rosario, and I'm still thinking about that last presentation and wondering how I'm going to carry two phones and where I'm going to put that, and especially on a, a dress like this. <laughs> um, you know, it I, I'm, it's, was fortunate that we are following the previous group's presentation because uh, listening to Kip and Dolan describe the team structure around executive sponsorship, product owners, um, and that more robust team structure, um, this website project is actually a, a great example of that type of structure in motion. Um, and so as as Kip mentioned, um, you know, the, the city had uh, severely under-resourced this project, uh, this very complex project and major undertaking um, from the beginning, um, but we course corrected uh, very quickly and we put a structure that they described in place and so I'm very proud of that as well. Um, so next slide, as you all know, thank you. Yeah, or we can, we can take that. As you all know, the project team had a highly successful launch and cutover of the website over Thanksgiving Day weekend in 2019. Um, and before we dive into the approach that we took with the website, I just want to remind the committee of the type of traffic our site garners, um, especially as being as the, the local city government and the capital of Silicon Valley. On average, the website performs 4 million total sessions from 2.5 million unique visitors annually. So that's a, that's a, a very robust site um, compared to some uh, other cities in the Bay Area. Um, so we're talking about a major digital property. And while the cutover from the old website to the new website took one weekend um, over Thanksgiving Day weekend, uh, the launch, it actually represents two and a half years of work and collaboration to complete this updated product. Um, so I, will, I, I do want to reiterate the complexity of the project and the intense level of collaboration that went into the development and the launch, um, not just collaboration among the core project team, which you'll see here in the Venn diagram, um, which is depicted here as um, our three, our three teams coming together, the Office of Communications and the City Manager's Office, um, the City Manager's Office of Civic Innovation and the IT Department, but also the broader support from 150 web editors and publishers in the departments. And these are designated liaisons uh, that Matt oversees um, on a day-to-day -day operational basis. So this was an intensive um, and complex project um, and uh, we're very proud of the success of the launch. So in total, the project took two and a half years to complete, but the team really ramped up mo the most in the fall of last year. And so you can see some of the activity um, and the, the um, dynamic nature of the, the team working together in these photos. Um, so in, early, um, in the early part of 2019, the city recognized that the project was under-resourced and added more investment in terms of funding and staff resources to the project. Uh, we put a more robust team in place, and you can see uh, the core team is theirs depicted in the, in the middle um, photo. And we also took time to define our minimum viable product, and so that was uh, the minimum product that we could launch to just first get the website out the door and then we plan to iterate and build um, and make any improvements on top of that. We did take an accelerated approach to complete the project by the end of the calendar year and uh, we, we did in fact also take a war 
room approach. And so to borrow one of Dolan's terms, um, you can actually see in the, the top and bottom photos, um, that's, that's us in the war room. Um, and just, you know, big thank you to the City Hall building team for um, getting that room set up for us. Um, they cleared it out very quickly and uh, we couldn't have done that without um, that collaboration space. And as most great projects do not begin without a vision, they also risk success without a clear focus and guiding principles in place to provide the project team with the lanes in which to perform their work. So in our case of the website project, uh, the key tenets that drove the development and vision of our work uh, were to create a more service-focused website that enhances our digital presence and reflects how residents were expecting to come to the city and conduct their business online. Uh, we also intended to promote governmental transparency and public access to information, improve the ability of residents to actively engage with their city government, and improve the efficiency and effectiveness of city staff for maintaining current and accurate information. And so you can see these tenants reflected in the principles uh, there on the slide. Uh, and we're going to use this as a framework for the rest of our presentation. Um, and so now I'll turn it over to Matt, who, Matt, who will walk you through this approach. Just gave you a new name. <laughs> Thank <Matt>. you, Rosario. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, Chairman, committee members, and the public. Uh, Matt Opsel, Senior Executive Analyst for the Office of Communications in the City Manager's Office. Starting with responsive design, we focused on improving the ability of residents to actively engage with the City of San Jose. As you may know, the previous website was not mobile friendly. You had to pinch and zoom to look at the content on your smartphone. That's not a great experience, and it's not, a res it's not responsive design. If you pull out your smartphone right now and go to www.senoseca.gov, you'll see that the new website is optimized for your device. Responsive design allows the website to provide a natural viewing experience for residents on any device by responding to device widths and optimizing as the page loads. We see that the, the present and future is mobile. An analysis of historical city website data from 2016 to 2019, indicates 4 million average annual visits with close to 3 million average annual desktop users and 1 million average annual mobile users. This equates to approximately four average annual uh, visits per capita. Comparing the historical data, we see negative 4% average annual desktop growth, while average annual mobile growth is up by 13%. As of 2019, Android and Apple iOS users collectively constituted 37% of total city website visits and will likely surpass 50% in the coming years. For example, Android users represented less than 1% of total visits in 2015, but grew to 11% of visits in 2019. iOS users grew from 6% of total visits in 2015 to 27% of total visits in 2019. Focusing on responsive design enables a consistent quality user experience ac across a wide variety of devices, from smartphones, mobile devices, and tablets, to desktops and laptop computers. Our fully responsive website enhances overall accessibility and the ability for residents to actively engage with the city of San Jose. Moving next into the customer-centric approach, we streamline the browsing experience by optimizing user journeys based on top services and searches. We've created an anim animated historical growth analysis graph for this slide. It may take a few seconds to start. This graph tracks the top requested service services vertically and the page visits horizontally from 2015 to 2020. The top five pages are the home page or the main landing page for the new website, the City of San Jose Careers and Jobs page, the Departments and Offices directory, the Parks and Rec uh, and Neighborhoods department page, and the City Services and Utilities Lookup page. Uh, I would now like to introduce Michelle to speak on usability. Thank you, Matt. Taking a customer-centric approach means that we started by thinking about what our residents and businesses are trying to get done when they come to our website, 
and by making it easy for them to find and complete those tasks. We accomplished this through three key strategies. First, we defined a citywide usability standard that makes it clear what good means for our users' experience. Second, we focus on the 10 most common user journeys or tasks for users on our website, such as registering for a recreation class or applying for a building permit. And third, and most important, we tested with users early and often. Before launch, we tested the website with over 100 users to understand where the pain points are, to make improvements, and then to validate that our improvements had measurably improved their experience. At the bottom of this slide, you can see the eight items in the city's, uh, the alpha version of the city's web usability standard. First, easy to use measured by whether at least three out of four users can complete a given task in a reasonable amount of time on a desktop or mobile device. Second, easy to understand, measured by whether the content is written in plain language at an eighth grade reading level or less. Third, error free, meaning that there are no bugs or broken links. Four, mobile friendly, meaning that the content is legible on your phone or tablet without needing to zoom or scroll horizontally. Accessible, meaning that the website is usable by people with disabilities as measured by federal accessibility standards. Six, consistently designed, meaning that the fonts and colors conform to the city's website style standards. Seven, fast, meaning that the content will take no longer than five seconds to load regardless of your device or network. Uh, and eight, discoverable, so that using popular keywords, the primary task pages will appear within the top internal search results. The result of applying these standards is a website that is organized by how our users search for answers. I'd like to highlight five aspects of the homepage design that exemplify this approach. And all of these features were iterated and improved upon over the past six months based on watching real users navigate the website. First, uh, we have six top requested buttons that are very prominent on the home page and make it easy for users to find the most common tasks, like browsing for city jobs or making a payment. And you can see these at the bottom of the slide. Uh, we've been very careful also to use language that reflects how our residents think about their tasks and to avoid city jargon. Second, uh, as you may have noticed, there's a prominent navigation menu across the top of the website with items in the menu selected and ordered based on user analytics for the most commonly visited pages. Third, there's a service finder tool that you can use to search for services by name and department. And that's paired with an address lookup tool where you can type in your address to find relevant information about city services near you, such as recycling and garbage collection. And this tool really leverages the power of city GIS mapping technology and a tool developed in collaboration between environmental services and public works. And then finally, internal search. Because internal search uh, and search in general is such a common way for users to find content, we've worked to optimize the search results for the most popular topics, and we'll continue to refine that search performance to make the results as relevant as possible. Now we'll turn it back to Matt to talk about accessibility. Thank you, Michelle. Our next focus was accessibility. Public access to information should not have barriers. This, may, this is made possible through ADA compliance and language accessibility for all residents. <clears throat> we remain compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA. Our accessibility practices include incorporating descriptive alt text for images and links, utilizing the built-in accessibility features from the Vision Content Management System, or CMS, and utilizing third-party compliance monitoring systems to remain fully compliant. This case study provides an example of our work to increase our compliance score and remain compliant. Prior to the new website, our compliance score was at 60% compared to the government industry benchmark. At launch, the new website compliance score was 63%. As of this week, our website compliance score is 88% which is 19% above the current government industry benchmark of 74%. 
The city of San Jose serves diverse communities and language accessibility is important. We've included Google Translate at the top of every web page. Google Translate enables all pages to be available in other languages, including Spanish and Vietnamese. In addition, 30 of the top requested pages will be translated into Spanish and Vietnamese as standalone pages. We are continuing to explore how we can make the site even more accessible for users who speak a primary language other than English. Matt, for context, could you give us a sense of how much traffic is on those top 30 pages? Exactly. Um, the top 30 requested pages is approximately uh, over 50%, so it would be about 55% of traffic. For marketing, next, uh, I'd like to turn this back to Rosario. Sure. So as, as communications director, one of the most frequent requests I receive is from departments who want to know how they can market their services and programs to residents so that residents understand what we're doing at the city and are taking advantage of a, a service that we provide or have improved recently. Um, so we saw this redesign as an opportunity to also serve the city and department's own marketing objectives. And um, what, we, what we created was a more dynamic uh, newsroom. Um, and so you can can find the newsroom under news and stories on the global navigation menu. It's the one that is uh, far to the right. And this newsroom is intended to uh, be a content marketing place, a place where we can market ourselves um, and share news and um, centralize news from the different departments. So the news and stories section, it features a press room with a better directory of contacts for reporters to reach out um, to the city and access subject matter experts uh, easily. Um, it also features city guidelines and standards such as filming guidelines, um, where to park if you're a member of the media, um, all of those types of details that will um, help the media interact with us and engage with us in a better way. And last, it features a citywide blog, which you can see a, a photo um, capture here. And this blog is a citywide blog. It aggregates department blog content all into one central news place. Um, and not shown here, uh, but also a great feature is um, an aggregate of all of our news releases and media advisories um, and just general information updates. So uh, now a reporter or um, a member of the public or other cities who are interested in seeing um, what the city is doing um, can access all of that news content all in one place um, and have a, a better understanding um, of all of the uh, innovation that's taking place here um, and how uh, we are a leader in many different areas. Thank you, Rosaria. The new website increases the digital publishing footprint for the city of San Jose. Published content can now be indexed by prominent search engines. This enables keywords to rank higher in search results and provides an opportunity to publish content that stays evergreen. The new website lets the city tell our side of the story on many issues and evolving situations. I would like to now welcome Apoorva to provide a quick glimpse at the upcoming resident assistant. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. The Mayor's Office of Technology and Innovation partnered closely with the City Manager's Office, IT, and iStrategy Labs over the last few months to build a beta of the resident assistant. And we're grateful for funding from the Knight Foundation and the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. And before I do a demonstration of this resident assistant, I would love to share some context with you. So the concept of uh, this was really born out of a desire to uh, build a solution that's going to help connect uh, our residents with the city in a much more seamless way, and also create greater transparency through what we initially envisioned to be a neighborhood dashboard. With that in mind, what we did was went out and did research, spoke with residents, analyzed data to understand what traffic patterns we saw, and considered what other cities had done. We really went in with one idea and one preconceived notion of what the solution could be, and all of our research and our conversations informed uh, what it eventually turned into, which is truly a testament to our desire and commitment to be agile, user-focused, and data-driven around this. So with all of this information, we identified the principles that we wanted to build a solution around. 
And all of this research told us that whatever we do, we really must focus on these five things. First, we want to help people accomplish useful tasks. Second, we want to use proactivity to reach residents and increase their engagement. Third, we want to be inclusive and accessible for all residents. Fourth, we want to show empathy by embodying the traits of our favorite neighbors. And five, have a manageable starting point that can really grow alongside the city of San Jose. So these principles is helped us establish the two key outcomes that, we've been that we want to achieve with this resident assistant. The first one is to reduce the burden on the call center employees, specifically for those calls that are coming from external constituents. The second one is to increase inclusivity and accessibility to government services. And inclusivity and accessibility can be defined through multiple lenses, but we especially considered uh, digital and linguistic uh, inclusion. So all of, these, all of this research, principles, and outcomes led us to what uh, we believe this resident assistant uh, should look like, which is a chatbot feature on the website coupled with a text or SMS service that addresses critical resident support questions, provides key information about city services, and empowers residents to take action. So we built the prototype, and I want to demonstrate that for you. So Matt, let's see it. So this is our website. On the bottom right-hand corner, you can see a simple non-obtrusive chat button. You have the box where you can type in uh, the keywords that you might be interested in searching. It's there in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. And these are some of the top requests that you can search. And we're grateful for the API that we received from the Environmental Services Division to actually in integrate this address lookup into the assistant. And our goal was really to not make it distracting and m help uh, residents achieve uh, the tasks that they're trying to in the easiest way possible. So this kind of shows you that you can walk through the different uh, service requests. And in addition to this uh, chat bot that's on the website, Matt, if you go to the next slide, we can see what the extension of the service looks like on text. So this is uh, what it would look like if you were to text the city the same questions. And when we think about inclusivity and accessibility, the reason why we wanted to ensure that this text service was a part of it was that we cannot forget those uh, residents who are digitally unconnected, which unfortunately happens to be 10% of the San Jose population. So this service is a way for us to reach those residents. And on the next slide, you will see that you can also access this service in Spanish and in Vietnamese, and it will respond in those respective languages. So we've tested this prototype, and feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. We've spoken with over 75 different residents. We also conducted focus groups with the various communities that we were interested in targeting, so the Spanish-speaking community, Vietnamese-speaking community, and community members who are liaisons to those who are digitally excluded and those who are experiencing homelessness. And all of this has really informed, all of this feedback has informed what's next uh, for this resident assistant, which is to really get it ready for a public beta in the late spring. And in the meantime, we're fixing some technical bugs around it, but also investing in a lot of training because this is something that can only get smarter as you put more into it. And our, the public beta that we're aiming for will also be followed uh, by working with IT to really understand what it will take it to scale it. So we're really excited about giving residents this feature as an addition to the new digital front door that Rosario has been talking about. And I'm going to turn it back over to her now. Thank you, Oporva. So the next steps for the city's website includes continued iterations and improvements. Here's a sneak peek at our release roadmap, and you can see that uh, under the new features section, there is the resident assistant that Aporva just previewed. We're very much looking forward to bringing that online to the website. Uh, we will continue to use data to drive our decision making and take into account ongoing website traffic and behavior to inform the launch of new features. Um, but I think what's most important for you to know is that we're not done. 
And that's what's so great about a digital property such as the site. We, we hope that you will continue to support future iterations of the site and look forward to the city's investment of this component of the city's digital front door. We, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go no, ahead. No, 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 no. I'm ahead of the guest. So I'm ahead of myself. <laughs> um, so we've shown you what we've accomplished as a team together and shared with you a sneak peek of our roadmap. And beginning in the spring time frame, we will roll out a marketing campaign as part of the rebrand of the 311 City Service and rebrand of the City My San Jose app. I would like to now just take some time to do, uh, some, do some major thank yous. Um, I want to recognize the entire project team, um, which you can see here on this slide, um, and all of the city staff for their great thinking time contributions and collaborations. Um, there were so many uh, city staff were involved, and, and we actually invited uh, the web team here today. Um, I also just want to take a moment to express my um, personal gratitude to Michelle. So oh, I, I too I will miss you, Michelle. Um, uh, Michelle was our, our usability lead in this project. Um, she was uh, spear, spearheading a lot of the testing um, and research that we did with our residents, and we couldn't have done that without her. Um, and then there's one more person who was especially valuable to our success, and, and that's Christopher von Bonstorf, our consultant at Granicus, um, who none of this, without him, none of this would be possible. Um, he was our partner throughout this entire journey and we're grateful for his expertise and his hard work. Um, so we've invited the, the web editors and publishers to be in the audience today. I know some of them had to leave, but if you were involved in the project, I'd just like to ask you to stand and just be recognized. Okay, I guess everybody went back to work, but thank you. to. <laughs> Thank you to the core project team that was here. Um, Julie Kim, Nira Dada, Jerry Dreesen, Chakradar Yalamali, all of these um, were members of our core project team and um, just wanna say thank you for all of the contributions and the hard work. And so with that, we are ready to take some questions. Just a couple of things in closing. I do wanna um, reiterate uh, my appreciation of Michelle and her work on this. And I, I will say, uh, unfortunately, we, we had to cut it for time. I am not making this up. She does have, based on uh, the musical uh, Hamilton, a usability rap um, that set to the music of Hamilton that she will do for you if you ask her. Um, I told her I would pay her 20 bucks uh, if she did it in front of council, but I'm afraid we had to cut that for time. But she, she will do it, and it is quite good. Um, second acknowledgement and appreciation uh, is uh, Jerry Dries, and we've talked a lot about the digital front door. The digital front door doesn't work without the digital back door, and the digital back door is all of the integrations and back end systems. And part of what we realized as we got into this is the enormous complexity of making sure that those integrations were seamless. And I, without Jerry's experience of having done multiple websites, I don't think we would have been able to get over that over that hump at all. So I really appreciate to Jerry and his team for making sure that the digital back door makes sure that the digital front door works. Um, <laughs> and then last, uh, a lesson learned, and then and then a, a sense of where this might point to. One of the lessons learned you see incorporated in the uh, tech audit, which is we should build this kind of team exactly the way we've built it, but we should do it before we launch the work on the project, not in the middle. <laughs> um, and so I appreciate Ed Rosario for uh, raising the red flag when it needed to be raised and bringing that to our attention and building that team. And we'll try to do that before next time, not in the middle. And then where this points, you know, one of the notions, it's a little tech jargony, but one of the notions that I, I like I think is very useful is this notion of omni-channel, which is all of the ways that you might interact with the city. So people will, will want to call us, they will want to be on the website, they will want to be on an app, they will want to interact with us in person. And because we're government and we want to be accessible to everyone, we need to continue to do all of those channels, and we need to do all of those channels very well, and all of those channels should be working on the same, from the same systems, the same process, and the same quality of experience, regardless of whether you walk in, you call, you use the web, or use the app. So a lot of what you're seeing now is the emergence of what I would call an omni-channel approach where we are uh, still having to learn is what does that mean in terms of things like language translation um, and other interactions, especially as language translation tools and natural language processing technology advances. So we still have a lot to learn on that, but we are beginning to think about this as an omni-channel and thinking about how we govern that so that the communications are consistent across and the user experience is consistent across. So that's a little bit of pointing toward what's next for us. With that, we'll take any, uh, as Rosario said, any questions you may have, feedback or guidance for us. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Beekman, did you come on down?
Hi. Um, I wanted to thank you for your uh, newspaper feature that you're going to have, to have articles and to have basically if it's a way that you can report on what you're doing within each department of city government uh, reported to us, that is stunning. Uh, that has incredible things that it can do. I hope I, we can all think of how we can develop that uh, in the future. It's a great idea. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, oh, uh, I, about the uh, search feature, um, you know, it, this, this app does seem better now. Uh, I'm still, I feel I give pretty exact information when I type in when I want something from the search. Uh, and it's not giving it to me. I get just, it does not at all give me what I'm asking for. And why is that happening? I know I'm kind of a, a twit, but I'm not that, uh, you know, out of it. And uh, it should be able to give myself that sort of information. And it, it doesn't do that often. And, you know, back in, up to about 2005, this was never a problem. And in fact, you know, I, I felt uh, before 2005, it would give information to people that was just amazing. Uh, it would give the exact information and then a plethora of, you know, really interesting facts. And now it just gives these really vague descriptions that just really have the feeling it's trying to throw you off what you're actually looking for and to keep things vague and opaque for you. And it's, and it's painful that that hasn't happened yet. You haven't made that switch over yet. I hope you can return to those times again. I think we all want to do that. And I just wanted to mention, uh, uh, you know, how this can all tie into IoT in the future. And I just can't stress the importance of what a good accountability and openness and open public policy practices can do uh, for IoT. I mean, it really should be in uh, Dolan Beckel's uh, resume uh, and how we talk about things. And it'll be an important point how I talk about it and how we can be excited and hopeful. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Davis. Thank you. I just want to thank the team. Um, this is awesome. I love the, the new digital front door. And I've already been telling people, because I, I don't know if you know, but a lot of people don't know still about the free junk pickup. Um, and it doesn't say free on here. And when you click when it says call junk pickup. So I've been telling everybody it's on the website and it's easy to find because you can just go right to the web page and it's one of the first buttons. So I, it's easier for people to find when I'm, I've literally said it at the last three community meetings in January. Um, but when you click it, it still says call junk pickup and then it does say free once you click in it. But on the, on the homepage, it doesn't say call free junk pickup. So that's my only, um, my only caveat and then also, the city services, the first one is adopt a pet and like I'm spending a lot of time, way too much time on the animal services site. So thank you, but also you're probably gonna cost me some money. <laughs> both both good, good feedbacks. Um, yeah, I th and I think that's a great point about the free junk pickup. I mean, let's, let's market ourselves. Uh, free is a very uh, compelling word. So I, I think that that's something we can certainly look into. It's a, okay, uh, Mayor Licardo. Okay, thank you, you're a true gentleman. Um, for, I also want to commend you too. I mean, doing the side by side comparison of the previous website and the new website is like, I, I, won't, I don't even want to say night and day, it's like a different time zone, different universe. And uh, so it's so impressive, uh, just a new look and feel. I, I even remember accessing the website on my phone when I first started on the council and it just just took you just to some random links I mean it wasn't even <laughs> it didn't even have any formatting it was just random links so we've come a long long way uh, my first question is about whenever you launch anything new obviously there's going to be bugs and and fixes that you need to make and you don't know about them until you actually roll it out what is the process to provide feedback <laughs> or for our residents to provide feedback when they come across dead links or other uh, issues or bugs in the, uh, on the website? 
Yeah, so uh, that's a that's a great question, and thank you very much for the compliments. Um, it's a it's a point of pride now, I think, for for the city of San Jose. Um, so uh, we're handling uh, feedback on the website in two different formats. Um, for internally, we do have a, a help desk uh, system created for employees who um, are who may be having issues with the site or have bugs, um, and so that's the way that they can report in. For residents, we don't have like quite that same type of help desk structure set up, but if they receive a, um, a, a broken link or form, there's actually an email address that they can uh, submit their inquiry to, and then Matt is the one who monitors that and responds to the resident's concern. They can also call us too, and we, we would respond to their concern or their request. Yeah, my concern with that is I don't know if residents would go that extra mile to to report that problem. So if, just a, a suggestion, a recommendation is if there was a feature on the website where they can report to any kind of technical issues or, or Hi, problems. Hi, council member, Matt Opsall. Um, if anyone gets a 404 page or a, a page that's broken, there's also a form on the page that they could fill out what they were looking for, oh. and that comes directly to us as well. Um, we do see um, comments and questions come through the My San Jose app as well. And so that's another way that, that residents can get out and reach us. Okay. And then um, my other comment actually was on the, uh, the internal search. Uh, I I'm one of the users that would go to the internal search first before I try to navigate through the website. And I know previously that the results that we were getting were not, were not very good. I haven't really tried the internal search um, the enhanced internal search, but I'm, hope, I'm hoping that it'll be a much better experience uh, because before it was, it was not a good experience. And that's definitely something we're iterating on. Um, we do have some improvements with the vendor for the internal search that we'll be rolling out uh, later this month. Great, thank you. Um, thanks, I was just distracted. Councilmember Davis got me looking at the adopted dog site. It's a lot of <laughs> cute little pets there. Yeah, a couple of German shepherds. Anyway, um, I just, uh, the, the, I was fascinated that 30 pages consume 55% of our traffic. And so we focused on those for translation. Certainly makes a lot of sense. Do we have any idea about how much um, currency we're getting in the, in, the, in the foreign languages in Vietnamese or Spanish? Are we actually getting many folks actually using them? I'm just wondering if too many folks just don't bother because they might feel like, oh, it's probably just an English, another English language website. Um, I think I'd actually want, Michelle, could you focus on? And I'll jump in here. So I, I think, uh, Mayor, we, we are still monitoring the current performance of the site um, and just looking at uh, the, the traffic and who's going to which pages on, on a whole scale level. Um, Michelle and the usability team, they are the ones who led uh, most of the testing out in the community. Um, and I think that while it's not an exact science to see um, what everyone is, is clicking on, um, they, the, the team did have some anecdotal evidence of what that experience was like. And so I think that's what I'd like Michelle to just describe. Absolutely. So um, uh, our uh, user research and design team, Near Data and Julie Kim, did do testing uh, of the new website uh, with residents who uh, speak Spanish and Vietnamese and have low English proficiency. And um, one of the findings was that these residents were really appreciative um, to find out that their was the Google Translate feature that made it possible for them to view the content. Um, so I think, you know, now that the website has launched, one of the things that we'll be really interested in continuing to understand and monitor is the analytics in terms of how much traffic we're getting in terms of the usage of uh, the Google Translate feature in various languages. Okay, so at this point we don't have data back yet on the actual traffic, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Right? Uh, the, the site launched on November 30th. Um, as far as phases of how we're tackling the work, uh, December and January were um, fixing any bugs, troubleshooting, broken links, um, just doing some of that type of cleanup. Right. What we'll be focused on in the next few months is really looking at that, um, not only just optimization, but also um, that traffic, who's, who's 
coming to the site? What are they looking at? Um, yeah. And so we'd be able to provide another update to the city, uh, to the Smart Cities Committee, even in another quarter. I appreciate that because I'm looking at it on the on the smartphone, uh, and it's not obvious to me where the Google Translate is. Is there a button somewhere on the yeah. on the front page? And the reason why I'm raising this is, you know, there's a lot of efforts we're engaged in right now around communicating to communities that have been hard to reach. And we think about, for example, the census, and we think about rapid response network and all the other issues that we know are unique to Spanish-speaking Vietnamese, speaking other language, other communities. And I'm just wondering to what extent it is obvious or apparent to them that this is something that's accessible. So currently, the uh, Google Translate is not available for the mobile devices. Oh. Um, so okay. desktop, tablet, um, we omitted it from mobile just because of um, the, the real estate at the top of the screen. We wanted to really focus in on, on what's most important. Um, I think that's also why focusing on 30-page um, translations and, and really moving forward with additional language services is very important. OK, well, I guess I would just ask if you know, we might reconsider that, it, given that what we know about the growth of mobile traffic, that that having something at the outset that says Espanol and whatever the script would be in Vietnamese, as I'm sure I can't pronounce it, um, it, it just would be so important or else, uh, you know, all the work we're doing in translating or accessibility will, will be for naught. And I, I'm hoping we'll consider that. Um, Appreciate all the work that everyone's put into this. I know it's been an enormous amount of work. Um, I, Porva, I really appreciate the presentation on the chat bot and text, because I know we've been talking about that for some time. Um, when do we expect that may launch? So the resident assistant will go into a, a soft launch beta uh, in spring. Um, and then once we um, are able to get more uh, and additional information from residents that'll go through an additional wave of residents testing and also technical testing, then we'll be able to really lay that out. But before the end of the year is, is the goal. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I will reiterate that it is going to be, uh, or the dependency there is on the vendor and being able to implement the vision that we have for the resident assistant. So where we're at right now in, in the development of that product is, um, like Aporva mentioned, we have a, a prototype. We, you know, we, we haven't actually um, moved into the implementation and the technical testing phase of that piece. And so I think uh, what we're targeting is um, spring time frame but it will depend on when the vendor can actually um, support that feature okay so we can provide more updates to the committee cool yeah and then so the visual experience will be with the resident assistant you'll, you'll have a, a box where you have a chat bot right and then there was also this text feature that seemed to be separate right Correct. so how do people know who to text what number to text to be able to get these answers the questions they have. Sure, I can chime in there. So uh, that will the, so that will require marketing uh, marking that assistant and the the text feature and the text number to the residents. Uh, oh. We've gotten a lot of feedback from residents that uh, the Spanish radio, for instance, is a great way to get uh, get that number sure. out out there. And we'll we're working uh, with our vendor to ensure that uh, the number is actually a shorter number and you know has some San Jose association so that we can uh, so it's more accessible to residents. Great, and, and so far we're thinking about doing it in three languages, is that right? Currently, yeah. Okay, great. Um, the, uh, I, I know that there have been uh, challenges as there often are with migrations of sites to broken links. Um, and I, I think we're still in the midst of trying to fix those broken links, is that right? Yeah, so when we started at launch, we had 2,115 pages of broken links with a total of 5,519 broken links. As of today, we're at 77 pages with a total of 76 broken links. Okay, that's great. Wonderful. Great to see so much progress. Um, and, and then finally, it really surprised me to see that we still have so many desktop users. Um, I just always assumed everybody had gone to mobile. 
And I'm wondering what that tells us about who the users are and where they are. And I'm wondering, does that mean that an awful lot of the users are actually within City Hall? Um, do we have any sense about sort of, well, I know we have an idea where people go on our website. Do we have a good sense of who they are? <laughs> Yes. Uh, so, um, yes, and I will say. Uh, so, I, I think that you're you're exactly right, Mayor. And um, you know, one of our audiences in the deployment of this project um, was internal, our internal workforce, um, because we do know that um, they're accessing the site for their daily business and daily operations to serve our residents. Um, so, uh, yes, a lot of that user traffic is coming um, from there. Um, I don't. I, well, I'm going to turn it over to Matt to to talk a little bit more about our um, site improved metrics and what we do know as far as uh, user traffic? So yeah, I would say yes in terms of internal traffic uh, and, and how I could look at that. We use a tool called Site Improve. Um, this is a tool, if, if you know Google Analytics, it's, it's a similar tool. It looks at all the traffic that comes to our website and can provide us with uh, things like SEO, accessibility, et cetera. Um, I can tell you in looking at the, at the data, um, that a good amount of desktop traffic, traffic is from internal users. Um, uh, and I could say, unfortunately, because I see a lot of I, IE11 traffic, um, a lot of people within the, the city still use IE11 as their main web browser. Um, we can also do IP filtering and, and verify that. But just on, on the glimpses that I've seen, I would say there's a good portion of the uh, desktop traffic that is internal. Because we're all stuck with an old version of Internet Explorer. Is that what you mean? Okay. Trying to understand. Correct. So, so uh, I won't venture to guess how far, how many versions we're behind, but <laughs> what are they on these days on Explorer? Uh, so Internet Explorer is actually end of life. Um, the, the next iteration would be um, Microsoft Edge, <laughs> and that's actually end of life as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that the the browser of choice for us is um, uh, Google Chrome. Chrome. Okay. Uh, good to know. I guess. <laughs> guess I'll trade in my <laughs> time to trade in the old Wang computer. Uh, all right, thanks, everybody. All right, I, I'll be quick because I know Councilmember Jimenez has to go soon. Um, with the, the top uh, 30 pages, and it's good that we're getting feedback and it's good that we're translating the top 30, but will we keep doing that? Because I, I imagine the top 30 will fall in just like, you know, the top 40 hits or whatever they're doing these days. Um, so can, 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 like, will that be current? So the... The top 30 pages was part of our original contract with the vendor, and so it was ta they were tasked with being able to provide those translations, and we're, we're vetting the content uh, with our own internal workforce. Um, and so there would be an additional cost for us to maintain and um, revamp that the translations on a regular basis, but I do think that that's something worth committing to, given that uh, more than half of our, our traffic is, um, is using those pages. Okay. Um... I guess my only other real question, let's, let's, that's a question for you, Rosario, or, or the people here, but I guess more of a comment. Um, and the city manager's not here, but I'll just make it anyway. I think that I, I'm grateful that we're doing the, the multilingual thing, especially in Vietnamese and, and Spanish. I was, I was, my screen's a bit frozen, but I was looking over Councilmember Jimenez's shoulder and I saw the, um, the screenshot of you know, the, the chat box in Spanish and Vietnamese. And I was reading the Vietnamese, and it, you can understand, I was, I was surprised at, at how, um, how you could comprehend it. There was a bit of unnatural kind of, you know, this is like a robot or something, uh, but, but still, it, it, you know, it made sense in, in terms of conveying and back and forth, I think it works. So I was quite surprised and quite pleased by that. Uh, but I guess my personal instinct, and I imagine the instinct of a lot of people, uh, is when you call a 1-800 number or something, you're just, I just always hit zero to like go through everything to try to get to an operator, try to get to a real person. Um, and I know we're trying to kind of, you know, save uh, people's time and do everything by AI and, and all that. Um, but to the extent that we turn people on to services being available offered in other languages, um, that's fine for triaging, but we need to be strong within our own city staff 
uh, with language capability for translation. And that means not hiring Vietnamese speakers who happen to be in housing or Spanish speakers who happen to be in DOT who can step up when you need, uh, but to have actual dedicated people who are proficient in technical terms, uh, ready to do it, and not just come through in a pinch, but are ready to do it citywide for us because that's their main focus. Um, because I do think there are gonna be people who, for some issues, are gonna get frustrated with a chat box or AI language exchange um, and wanna talk to a real person. And you know, there may not always be a Vietnamese council member who can speak Vietnamese here, um, or a Spanish one for that matter. So um, just something to throw out there, and I hope that you know, as we expand this and turn people on to services being offered, we need real people behind the screen to, to pick up where the technology falls short. Um, and that's my only comment. So can I get a motion? All right, all in favor? All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have to pull myself away from Kate, the German Shepherd who's adoptable, really, really cute. I, I, I had no idea, now I'm gonna be stuck for hours watching the wonderful cats and dogs. Um, but we're gonna shift from that to um, spatial data. And uh, this has as much a soft spot in my heart as uh, cats and dogs, uh, because we're a city, and cities are place-based, and their essence, they are uh, spatial. And so if you wanna understand cities, if you wanna understand city services, you need to have spatial data that tells you where you are and where you are relative to other things. And that, once you have that, you can begin to do analysis, which allows you to see the, that data, understand the patterns, derive insights, and drive action. Uh, I'm really pleased that over the last several years in this city, our public works function led by Matt, Lesh, and team have been developing a very robust center of excellence in both spatial data and geographic information systems. And so I'm gonna have Matt Lesh, Nicole Reyes, uh, and Andrew Eric, our new data analytics lead, walk you through some of our capabilities around spatial data and a little bit of complimentary uh, look at our non-spatial data developing capabilities as well. So I'll let them uh, take it away and I'll tear myself away from the puppies to listen. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for uh, switching our presentation to last. Always say, better to save the best for last anyways, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, good afternoon, I'm Matt Lesh. I'm the Assistant Director of Public Works. And as Kip said, I'm joined here by uh, Nicole Reyes. She is the master behind the master address database and the pertinent integrations and integrations. And also with our new partner in crime, Andrew Eric, who is the data analytics lead in this Office of Civic Innovation. Oh, and by the way, if you want that dog or cat, we, I know people who can help you. <laughs> Public works function, remember? Okay, so here we're focusing on one of the areas that is, is a, one of our enterprise initiatives. And so what we're gonna talk about through here is we're gonna draw the line and then make some connections between spatial data and GIS technologies. We're gonna talk about our repository of spatial data and what it is, how we built it, how we build it, and what's on its way. Then we're gonna talk about, the, draw a little distinction between what Andrew and Nicole's worlds look like and then how we connect those between spatial data and non-spatial data. Nicole's gonna strut her stuff on what she's built and then maintains, and then show what she's done with the master address database, including some of the stuff around the census and the LUCA and, the, and, and some integrations that she manages. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what the team has done and what has worked on wrangling the power of the repository and other applications. So first, spatial data and GIS technologies. We often talk about GIS and people always say, oh, there's our mapping group. I say it all the time, GIS is not maps. GIS specialists maintain data that is capable of being mapped but is also employed in applications and can be analyzed many ways. And so our GIS specialists, way back in the 1980s when it first started, they were just drawing lines. These have evolved into very technical positions. Many of our team have master's degrees in geography and other spatial sciences. And so they are really data scientists and data managers in that sense. And so they are managing spatial data. And so what spatial data really is, is that layers of connection, and we'll talk more about it and draw some distinction between that and non-spatial data, but really kind of focusing right now on the spatial data and the, then the tools by which we look at, maintain, and visualize that spatial data. 
both desktop tools, mobile tools, aerial tools, how we integrate with them, the integrity and maintain the auditability of those tools. And so we'll talk a little bit more as we get to spatial data in a minute. So back in 2016, we, again, it's not meant to be readable, it's meant to be blurry on purpose just because of the volume and we'll see why in just a minute. And so stay with me on the slides, don't cheat and go ahead, just kidding. Um, in 2016, after a three-year effort to kind of realign and transform our legacy GIS and spatial data systems into an integrated repository of spatial data, here we have about 263 of data sets that were the result of that effort. We spent about three years kind of aligning these data sets and migrating them from this really arcane system that took a really long time to train people because we had our own data model. We had figured out the San Jose way to do this which is the dumbest, dumbest thing we could have done because it took a really long time to transition. Anytime we brought a new staff member, they really weren't useful for about six months to producing and maintaining data because we had to train them and teach them and, and all these iterations. So one of the, we came with a, we, we didn't come up with, we tried to look for a standard unified data model and that data model is, is kind of configured and developed by Esri, our partner on this, uh, um, and that it is the local government information model. Sounds pretty apt apropos to what we do. We talk about LGIM, local government information model, and so what Esri says, if you make these things, this data, these data sets in this data model, our applications will work with, those da with that data model as they just plug right in. So every application they come up, it will work with LGIM. And so our, our trick was to, how do we get through all our data sets, make them LGIM compliant so that they all sing? And that's really been, been the magic. So, some of the things about this repository, the, tech, the technology and the infrastructure behind it is highly available, it's very stable. We house it with ITT, ITD's infrastructure. We do what we do well as far as managing spatial data. They manage databases and, and systems and infrastructure. We basically buy it and rent it and, st and store it with them. So we partner with them about setting up the databases and servers in with ITD, but we manage the spatial data repository there. It's accessible to all city staff, with, especially with GIS tools, with rules, because if people aren't, if we don't want people looking at municipal water information necessarily, we just want to make sure that we, we govern that accordingly. It's published on our data download page in accessible formats like KMZ and shape files for those with skills can access it. But we also spin out web maps, and we have a web map that has more layers than you'd ever want to see, um, that you can view this stuff as well. Fast forward to 2020, a bit of progress. Um, 544 data sets are there now as we sit, so slow and steady progress with our departmental partners. And again, it's not really meant to be viewable in a sense but just because of the volume of them. These are still all LGIM compliant. They're maintained, and part of the beauty of it is we, those who are the data specialists in FHIR, in DOT, in parks, they maintain all their data sets still, but it's, think of this as their hard drive for their data sets. So before there were people storing stuff on their desktop or storing stuff over in other places. I mean, it was just really, really inefficient. Um, so we reduced this scattered environment. We're not done, but we've reduced this. And we've come up, and again, still maintaining that uniformity with the data model, saving on the infrastructure so that anybody, so if other departments needed to spin this out and maintain it, they needed to have databases and servers and the authentications and all those things that we maintain now that is broadly used, they had to, that has to be duplicated and it's expensive. How have we done it? Well, the best way, I heard an interesting podcast the other day, kind of like, how did we do this? And it was, the best way to get across a crowded room is a slow and steady path, and just keep on trucking. Some of it is my bullheaded determination along with the people on our team. Some of it's sweet talk, I'm not kidding, we had to try to, and look, it's really gonna be great for you, we promise. Um, some of it is by paying, say, look, I, we, that data set needs to be here, not for us, but for all the others, because now once we publish it here, then everybody else who has the tools can access that data set. So it's not public works doesn't want it, the enterprise doesn't want it, it's for the betterment of the group. But a lot of it is training, so we have to train people how to build their stuff in the data model. Again, it's, there's nothing really fancy about LGIM, it's just how do you configure the columns, how do you configure the stuff in the cells, and, and just following those diligent rules so that it all sings when you go to plug it in. And we also have made the, the other big victory out of it, we've made it so our GIS specialists are plug and play. 
people are in school learning Esri products, they're learning LGIM, they're learning this thing other places, so it doesn't take six months anymore for the person to come in and figure out the San Jose way and spatial data modeling. They've learned this other places, and so we're able to plug and play. We brought in two new people. I've turned over chair, the chairs in our group three and four times, and still we haven't really missed a beat of getting those people in, up to speed fairly quickly, and then, and then operating and maintaining our data and spinning out applications. It's really been pretty amazing. So up next, a few things going on here. Some are faster than others. Some have higher priorities than others. This isn't in any priority rank. We have some challenging vetting and security things we need to resolve. Some of them are just gonna be super heavy lifts of a lot of, some of it's a lot of digitizing, some of it's a lot of work, but if, these are some of the key things we're focusing on here of, of the next up things that are on the list. Okay, what's the difference between what Nicole does and what Andrew does? Um, and so I, I had to kind of figure out how to pace this thing together, the, the spatial data and the GIS technologies and then non-spatial data and spatial data. So on the top is a little bit of a slice of Andrew's world, a very simple slice of Andrew's world. That same slice with Nicole's spatial lens on it is below it. And so this non-spatial lens, oftentimes you'll use a, the difference between them is gonna, you're gonna use a different set of analytical tools. They can still be analyzed, still compared, but there's a different set of tools than the spatial ones. And like you'll need some of Andrew's horsepower to figure out how to do that. And Andrew will strut his stuff in a bit and talk about some of that stuff. But on the spatial side, that's ready to map. It's ready to, for proximity comparisons, and those things are, and those relative comparisons are relatively straightforward. That fancy code there that nobody knows what it means and translates, the machines do, and they translate that. So the tech haves, those with those Esri or those ArcGIS or AutoCAD and GeoCortex tools can consume that, have it mapped, but it also gives that bit of difference of GIS, the spatial data has um, not just a, an X and a Y like we think of, but it also has, is it a point, is it a polygon, is it a line, so it has attributes to it that are much different than just the flat table as they sometimes call them. But sometimes we need to have these things play together, and as you've heard from some of the applications that have been presented already, um, we have to sometimes go from the flat data tables this, the non-spatial data into the spatial world. We need to be able to map those and present those. So sometimes we'll get things from Andrew's bit of fun and take them into the GIS with GIS tech. So one of it is geocoding. So there's three different techniques that you'll often see in here. Um, geocoding is just an algorithmic tool that our spatial team has developed. They've honed it over time. Likely that address lookup tool that's in that um, tool that's on the website, it, utilizes the geocoder that they've developed to type in and present back stuff that's in the master address database, known addresses to known parcels within San Jose, that then connects it to the other databases. And so the geocoder is a bit is an algorithm thing that we can program, and it helps us kind of, and, and you, you experience it when you do a Google map search. When you say 200E or 200E dot or 200 east, it knows what to do with those things. That's what I sort of mean by kind of translating into a useful known thing. And are you mixing up Capitol Avenue or Capitol Street or what, you know, mixing up those things? The second one is a relative comparison. So sometimes we'll get those things for a call for service. So we'll get this list of things. There's a mattress 150 feet to the side of this thing, this address here. And so we need to do a relative. So how do you map that so you send the right, who, which uh, support staff district is that in? And so we get those, the ability to take that address, put it on a place on the earth, and get somebody and find out who, what resource is there. And the other bit is we get, we'll get lat long. Sometimes mobile devices will just spit out a lat, a, a, a lat longitude and latitude and, and send it over, and then we'll pull it out from a table and be able to map those as well. So we take these things so we can interact, operate between the flat non-spatial data and then interact with the spatial data. So I'm gonna pivot to Nicole here, and Nicole's gonna talk about what she does with just one bit of one of those 544 data sets in the master address database. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, Mr. Chair, committee members, and members of the public. My name is Nicole Reyes, Information Systems Analyst with the Department of Public Works. One of our accomplishments that we gained for the city was creation of the address portal. This entire project was the culmination of the master address database, which we worked on for over two years. 
The address portal is an internal web application for addressing staff to assign addresses. It is also used as a lookup tool for city staff, including public safety dispatchers. By using this application, an address gets created in two repositories, GIS and in Amanda. As you can see from the diagram, the GIS team enters the necessary base map data, such as parcels and street center lines, which is needed for the addressing staff to input address points. Within this screenshot, aerial imagery is shown along with address points on each residence. By selecting on specific tools from the toolbar above, an address attribute window appears, which is where staff can enter values in the required fields. To the right, there are additional layers that staff can toggle on and off to assist with determining what is the best location to situate an address. Once the address is saved, the record simultaneously gets created in GIS and in Amanda as a property record. This information can then be accessed by city staff and the public. The address portal was a collaborative effort between Public Works and PBCE, which has progressed to the, pro the project into becoming a spatial data integration program. From the completion of the newly enriched master address database, we focus on integrating this data set with various applications throughout the city. Keep in mind that address points are just one data set out of the 544 that Matt mentioned earlier. Depending on the business needs of an application, we have integrated various data sets other than address points. We successfully integrated with multi-departmental applications such as Amanda and Ju Cortex for permitting use. Last spring, we worked with Animal Care Services and implemented our address data into their shelter case management application, Chameleon, so staff can save time during data input by having address fields become auto-populated. Public safety has always integrated with our data, but was, but was able to enrich their address information with the use of the MAD. The county also uses our address data for internal GIS needs and for their 911 dispatch system. Going forward, we are continuing to work on more integrations in the future. Not in particular order, but we plan to work with the following. The city website, and just as Michelle mentioned earlier, um, offers a lookup tool for residential services, including waste pickup, street sweeping, and water service provider. DOT, which houses many applications, such as residential parking permit, vehicle abatement, and tree and sidewalk inspection. Housing, we initially did a preliminary integration but are in the process of completing it with both their rent registry and their multiple housing roster. Police and fire record management system and the Office of Emergency Management where we supported San Jose during PG&E's multiple public safety power shutoffs and are now currently creating tools for a flood event. Throughout these integrations, we focus on using no code ETL tools, ETL standing for extract, transform, and load. This was critical for us to implement because whenever possible, we want to have the ability to manage these integrations and applications within our team and not have to rely on a custom coded backend. As we all know, the census 2020 will occur in less than two months. Prior to this, our team took part in the local update of census addresses operation or LUCA. This was the first time that San Jose took part in this program, which provides an opportunity to review the Census Bureau's residential address list and also have the ability to provide necessary updates to that list. Our goal was to have an accurate housing unit count. From the table shown, the 2010 count for housing units was 314,000, and with the provided master address file, it went up to 335,000, a difference of 21,000. After months of evaluating data sets and creating different iterations of our workflows, by July 2018, we had a final output of 342,000 housing units. By fall 2019, we were able to supplement that amount with an additional 6,500, resulting the final count to be 348,000 housing units, units. Now, per a California Census Office, every Californian miss in the 2020 Census causes the state to lose about $20,000 in federal funding over the decade. With this in mind, we understood how significant our work would positively impact the community and made it our mission to maximize San Jose's unit housing, unit count accuracy. Now, achieving those numbers was not an easy feat. Again, since this was San Jose's first time participating in the LUCA, we needed to figure out what, we, what would be the workflow to determine the most accurate ho housing unit count. Initially, we reviewed about a dozen address datasets 
to ensure our master address database had the most complete housing units so that it could be used to compare against the census master address file. Once the MAD was updated, we had to apply multiple methods to determine what addresses should be added or deleted to the list. The most difficult method to establish was how to identify which address points should be considered residential. We initially referred to the residential polygons within our zoning layer, but soon found out that the results did not represent the Census Bureau's definition of a housing unit. When we then decided to use Santa Clara County's parcel data along with their land use code for each parcel, we overlaid our address points and filtered out anything that was not residential. From this, we assigned specific codes to addresses that need to be added, deleted, or were outside of our jurisdiction. This was done in a protected environment and completed by our entire team. Staff had to work after normal business hours, including weekends, in order to meet the deadline. This is just one example that focuses specifically on the use of addressing data. There are hundreds of data sets that are part of our GIS repository, and Matt will continue to provide examples on how we are working with other departments to integrate with those systems. Thanks, Nicole. Notice she didn't produce one map out of that whole effort. It was all data. I wasn't tricking. So the next bit is talking about how we take that repository of data, integrate it with other systems to produce greater value. Um, we have two examples we're gonna share. One is the housing opportunity site in the last budget cycle. We were funded with a bit of money for a two year pilot to develop a housing opportunity site. And what we're doing is we're, pi we're partnering with a company called Ptolemy out of Boston. We have one of our GIS specialists, not Nicole, but other two applied math majors from, as interns from San Jose State, just to make it interesting. And what we're doing, so you're getting a super alpha sneak peek here. Super alpha. Okay. Mapping residential parcels, presenting a property profile, pulling in from dozens and dozens of data sets, both ours and the counties, so we can get a possible, so again, there's nothing magic about 2302 Mirth Street, it's just an example of potentially a place that could be ripe for, for um, additional development. What we're doing is we're taking a, a snapshot of all this data, applying some kind of strength or coefficient that the housing people would say is important to indicate this property or parcel is ripe for development and have it pop out of the map of, and, and provide insights. And so, again, super sneak peek, uh, super alpha will be presented out, largely will be ready for prime time to show, show more in, in the fall. The next bit is on the integrations for insights in the EOC. So in the in, in summer 2019, we had been given the foresight that there's lots of, that there's going to be some power safety, uh, public safety power shutoffs, and there's been a lot of coordination with Ray and his team about what does this mean. Lots of spreadsheets getting shared left and right, and so I set out some high-level principles and objectives to get our staff ready to deal with this and in, in, on the on the GIS side, in the spatial data, and in the mapping side. So how do we take these dozens of spreadsheets that people are passing around, I like this generator, I want that generator, I like that building, and that, it was, there were literally spreadsheets going back and forth, so the principles were, it needed to be a web map. So just need a browser to view, Internet Explorer or otherwise. Um, easy, we could control access by just changing a URL if we needed to, that's one reason why we wanted to do it. And so easy to control access, and the screen could be responsive largely if you build it in a browser the way we were gonna build it. I wanted no tech tools. Kip is really, really smart, but he doesn't wanna sit through a three-day training to figure out how to use the GIS tools to make his assessment. So make it so there's, so super simple, so you didn't need to develop stuff. We need to be flexible and, flexible and nimble. Quite often we outsmart ourselves thinking we know what we're gonna need. And so we needed to move as we go and, and get forward with that. And then part with which got really close to it, we need to figure out what our stakeholders are to get some engagement from them. How do you employ that resident army to get information? Um, we don't want Twitter, we don't want Facebook, we don't want a special app that someone has to download and figure out, create an account to know how to do. How do we do that? And so in about two hours, that thing on the right was produced in the middle of PSPS1 to edit. It was very, very easy to edit and push out. It's just a, it's just a URL people can download, and then and they don't need to download. So I just load that URL. The EPIOs were sending it out through Twitter, and people could provide us information. We're using that information to define our polygons. The only negative, the initial push, it was only in English. Um, we've since pivoted, so now we can 
with one touch of a button, it translates into English. The next version will pivot and translate into Vietnamese as well. The money shot. This is the first public view, and I don't know if you've even seen it, um, of our internal map that we were using. People were asking, are we nervous about what's showing here? Um, required secure network access to view and use. The whole team was ready to equip. Again, this was built with base Esri tools, no customization, just uh, configuring the base tools. This was largely led by one of our staff members, one of Nicole's cohorts, um, Joel Clark, but it was meant so that all the team can edit and maintain it because Joel's not strapped to his desk 24 hours a day as much as we'd like to. So we made this a polygon game. And so what I mean is, we, how do, those green polygons, again, this is just a sample snapshot. Those, those polygons, we have piles of data sets that I'll show you in the background that are viewable here. How do we use those polygons to suss out what's within that? So our goal was to draw these polygons as nimbly and as fast as we could, so that on the right, it projects that there's 264 or 26 facilities that are touched and so forth. And so we, as if we can refine and move those polygons, it would get us to what facilities or people or intersections were impacted. But you click on that down arrow and out pops a list of the actual sites. You could put that out into Excel spreadsheets, do whatever you want to it and have fun with it. These are just a couple of the data sets. These are all the data sets actually that are embedded in here. These, many of these started as a spreadsheet that we had to then geocode. So that's back a couple of pages ago. We had to geocode a lot of those things and, and we bring them in as a data set here. Some are from our repository, repository, but some are from other data sets. If you see those two little railroad track signs on the left side there, about halfway through uh, maybe beginning of PSPS1, it got nervous, like, wait a minute, if the power is out there, the train tracks, the switching and the controls will be out in that area, we might have stranded trains. So we had to go figure out how to indicate which street had railroad crossings that are within there. So we, again, as a possibility to iterate. So some of these things came from other areas. And then finally, to talk about what systems we integrated. So some of these systems are public works responsibilities like fuel and generators. Some of them are DOTs like lights. And, and signals. Some of these are third party uh, applications we integrate with, like our vehicle telematics, but also the transmission lines from PG&E. And so each one of these we have an API call directly into so we can know how much fuel is within those, uh, those fuel tanks at any given time by clicking on, on the icons that you no longer can see secretly. And then also same thing with the generators, which ones have been engaged and which one haven't. Again, all to know which, which areas are, have generators on so our fueling staff can know which generators they need to monitor and fuel. Same thing with the streetlights being on or off. Matt, if you could click back a couple. Uh, I just want to add in one point. Yep. Yeah, so part of what this allowed us to do, I was, as I'm sitting in the EOC director chair on this, is two things are happening, the, the, three things are happening with this that are great. One is that the team itself is using this, using this data without having to have direction from above, and they are just doing what it needs to be done to make sure everything is refueled. Two, we're able to have a common situational awareness out to the community and internally on everything that's going on. And then three, we're able to see these patterns. And I, I've told this story a couple of times, but I just want to spend a quick moment on this one because it, it really points out the value of spatial uh, data rather than just data. So we gotten, um, after a, a bit of wrangling, we'd gotten access to the list of people who do um, have the base, medical baseline customers who require uh, medical devices. And in addition to, to just having the list, we then plotted it spatially. And once we plotted it spatially over uh, the overlay of our neighborhoods and the overlay of the likely power shutoff, I was looking through it and we were doing, all doing our assessment. And I noticed that there was one neighborhood that, that if you took the data literally, there were no people who had the uh, medical baseline. There was this whole giant neighborhood where the power was going to out, go out, but for some reason, this whole area had no medical baseline numbers. Statistically speaking, that was impossible. And so what I did at that point was I, I had my Slack channel opened up on the other side, and I pinged Matt on the Slack channel, and I said, hey, this is what I'm seeing. Can you go back and, and verify, the, verify the data and tell me if I'm looking at uh, bad data or if this is correct? And the team began working on that in real time and very got the answer back. PG&E gave us an in incomplete data set. 
we're getting the real data set from PG&E. We got it and we found hundreds of people whose power was about to go off on them who had medical baseline, who hadn't been notified, and who we didn't know about until that point. And without the spatial display of that data, there would have been no way that we would have known that these 900 people or several hundred people needed that. Um, and so this capability is just is enormous to us in emergency situations, especially the ability to add these multiple data sets in in real time. So that's what has been done. This is a little forward-looking. Then Andrew is going to tell us some forward-looking things on his. So we have, we're in contract negotiations with Esri to, uh, for an enterprise agreement, which will unleash even more licenses and tools. Because one of the things, once the power of the repository is there, we need to democratize the access to that data by providing native tools to, that are more useful to the planners and engineers and housing staff so that they could do some work that they don't require specialists to do. There's ready tools that are part of that agreement that we'll be able to hand out and get trained up so that people can use those tools in their work. Um, so we're not going into too much detail here, but I think even like the, the GIS data portal, we see that as really key for the engagement around the redistricting that results out of the census next year. Um, that we'll be able to, it's a really great public engagement tool around data and information and, and communication, but lots more stuff here, just lots of things that'll be new tools that'll be available for staff once that contract gets signed. I'm gonna hand it over to Andrew, and he's gonna give you a glimpse of what's going on on the non-spatial data side. Thanks, Matt. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, Mr. Chair, committee members, and members of the public. My name is Andrew Eric, Data Analytics Lead in the City Manager's Office of Civic Innovation and Digital Strategy. I joined the city last November, having spent the previous seven years working on enterprise data analytics and data management in the private sector, and several years before that doing graduate work in urban policy and public management. I'll keep my additions this afternoon very brief in anticipation of speaking to you on future occasions. However, because the goals of data analytics work and data writ large are so closely intertwined with this work, we wanted to provide a brief update on what we are planning for maturing, maturing our data analytics capabilities across the city. I have three main updates for you today. First, as anyone who works here knows well, we have already come quite far in our use of both spatial and non-spatial data. So much so, in fact, that this past December, Bloomberg What Work Cities preliminarily assessed us to be amongst the highest performing data-driven local governments in the country. Bloomberg What Work Cities Bloomberg What Works Cities is the national standard for excellence in data-driven local government. It is a sought-after recognition for cities, and importantly for us, it is also a critical investment confidence measure for Bloomberg as they make funding decisions. We receive this certification based on showcasing the excellent data-driven work from across San Jose, including and especially what you've just seen. Bloomberg will be validating this preliminary assessment with a visit here at the end of this month, and we will of course provide you with an update once we receive our official certification score. However, everyone across the city should be proud to have reached this stage, as it obviously speaks to the work we've done over many years and even decades to be more data-driven in service to our community. However, we know we can still do more. My second update is that over the past three months, I have been working with many across the city to define what this path might and should look like. I have met with, I think now, more than 50 stakeholders inside and outside San Jose to understand both our successes and our challenges in using data. These learnings inform the drafting of a citywide data strategy, which has been reviewed by the City Manager's Technology and Innovation Governance Board, including many you see here. As Matt noted, a critical element of this plan is ensuring that our spatial data strategy and our non-spatial data, data strategy work together. And of course, that they both take advantage of the technical foundation that our information technology department maintains and is continuing to build. I can tell you right now that I plan to basically steal a lot of what Matt has done in spatial data and put it to use for the rest of our data across the city. We're also working closely to ensure that our data practices abide strictly by the city's digital privacy principles and our forthcoming privacy policy. Finally, my last update for today is that as part of this strategic planning work, we have identified four high value data pilot projects, which we are currently evaluating to move forward with. The goal of these projects and how we chose them is twofold. First, to provide value to the city and community in the form of more effective, efficient, and equitable services. And the second is to be the first step in our incremental citywide data journey um, 
in that these projects will enable us to test and demonstrate key capabilities of the larger non-spatial data strategy. These four projects are in collaboration with development services, environmental services, parks, recreation, and neighborhood services, and the My San Jose platform. I'll conclude there for now, as we are considering an agenda ad to provide a deeper dive on these topics at an upcoming committee meeting, and I look forward to speaking with you more at this time. I'll turn it back over to Matt. So we're ready for questions if you have them. Oh, not oh, quite. Oh, not quite, not quite. Uh, just wanted to very quickly, um, appreciation of Matt and his leadership. This is uh, really a center of excellence, and that, that means it's done three things. One, it's, it's focused on something that's strategically important for us. It's done it at a level of excellence, and it's gone beyond the individual department perspective. And so as we look at our technology governance uh, across the city, this is an example of a centralized function that does not need to be centralized in the IT department. And this is what we're trying to do is strengthen the ability to make sure that um, we're pulling Matt and his team into the way that we govern centrally, but we don't necessarily need to reassign the people and the personnel over into the IT department. So I think it's a really good example of, of how we can build out our technology governance across the board. And then finally, I would say it's also an ability, uh, example of, of what um, some of the investments that you made, how well spent they have, have been. I remember a couple of years back, uh, there was a little bit of internal wrangling as we were cost trimming, and there was a, a, a $200,000 item around ESRI licensing that was about to get tossed out. And uh, we made the case that building this uh, capacity would would pay off. And I think if you if you round if you do the numbers on the math on the census data alone, uh, my calculator uh, doesn't uh, isn't able to round up that many zeros uh, it, to to show you how much money we were actually able to generate and save with these capabilities. So I think this is money well invested and certainly worth that two hundred thousand dollar Esri license that we wrangled about a few years ago. So money well spent and really appreciative of Matt and Nicole and, and the leadership of the rest of the team. Happy to take any questions you might have. Great. Thank you. We'll go to public comment, Mr. Beekman. Hi, um, hopefully uh, with this issue, uh, you can be patient as I try to take a broad approach about this subject. Um, you know my feelings about openness and accountability, and this doesn't necessarily quite apply to this subject, but it was mentioned with the first net responder stuff that you're trying to develop uh, more better practices with the actual corporate people that you'll be working with. Uh, for say the first net and I'm sure for these issues. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I really have to emphasize that with good IOT practices that stresses accountability and openness and publicness, uh, public accountability anyway, it's a way that, you know, can invite, you know, uh, really good practices, I think. And, uh, you know, I hope that can be noted and um, because it's my feeling that from, you know, large corporate structures that you're working with right now that we're starting with in our beginnings here, it's the, it's the with the idea to build down to lower, smaller. Mr. Beekman, I'm going to cut you off if you could talk about the. It is too, yeah. it's too, right. too broad. Okay. I will save this for open forum. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Davis. Thank you. I just want to, I'm sure I have many questions, but it's for an offline discussion. Um, I just want to thank the team. This is, this is a great presentation and it's, it's super awesome to see how we've been able to integrate all the data or at least, what did you say? 500, over 500 data sets. Um, together, it's fantastic in, um, Chappie and I were had a little side conversation, and we will not call you guys mapping folks anymore. <laughs> Mayor, yeah, I just um, as you know, I've been uh, just a huge cheerleader to see this. It is really wonderful and um, so important and life saving uh, as we see. And so I just want to say thank you to the entire team, everyone, and 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 Matt in particular. But I. <clears throat> You know, I, I can remember talking in front of the cameras about this 
uh, probably not finding the right words, but you know, it's really hard to describe this in ways that are sexy enough to get into the, the nightly news. And I just struggle to think about how we can better broadcast the good work that's being done, um, both because I think we need to justify to the public why we're investing in, in data and technology and why we're investing in the skills for, for our team to be able to skill up in this space and, and also to celebrate the good work. I mean, clearly um, uh, the PG&E didn't win any awards for the PSPS event, but clearly we should have. And I, I just think um, there must be ways we can better communicate this uh, to the outside world about what we're doing and why. One, one small way, is it? One, one way that I felt a little personal satisfaction, Cron4 was using our public facing map as their right. map um, during the PSPS event as opposed to any other map. So that was validation enough for me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, one small way the story will be told, um, uh, uh, Professor Stephen Goldsmith was so excited by it when he heard it that he actually delayed the publication of his book, which is focused on the use of spatial data in local government and ha had an extensive interview time with Matt and the team to understand cool. the tool. And so this tool will be featured as part of uh, that book on the best practices in local government and uh, spatial data use. So uh, it's a pretty geeky audience, but uh, one that we like a lot. Yeah, he'll make all of the students at Harvard read it, so that's good enough. Uh, that's great. Well, uh, yeah, I look forward to, you know, finding ways we can sort of broadcast this to the community. I think our, our, our residents need to know the good work that you guys are doing. Thank you. I'm just going to say you guys give data nerds a good name, so, so that's great stuff. Um, I was going to make a reference to, like, there's a, if you go, if you become a dentist, you have to take this, this test, like the LSAT for lawyers or, or the GMAT for business folks, where you have to do the 3D, three spatial thing that's, you're looking at somebody's mouth with a mirror and looking at their teeth and their cavities. And so there's like a dot test you have to take. And I hung out with a lot of dentists, pre-dental pre students in, in, in law school, and it never made any sense to me. So the fact that you guys can think three-dimensionally and, and you know, as the object is moving, that's beyond me and it's very impressive. So much admiration to you. Um, that's all we have. Can I get a motion? Move. All right, all in favor? Aye. And it passes. Motion accepted. On to open forum. Huh? Oh, all right, good. Um, <laughs> and uh, on to open forum, Mr. Beekman, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you. Uh, I feel the ideas of open public policy and responsible, accountable, Minimal use practices can work hand in hand and as equals with uh, neighborhood safety, st stability, and green sustainability. And in the goals and questions of technology, surveillance, and data collection that can have an important auxiliary role in the ideals of Vision Zero. It is these sorts of ideas and partnerships between ourselves at this time that should be some of the very ideas of how to develop the future of Vision Zero principles of, of community harmony and green sustainability and how to grow what can be a new era of good legal precedence, organization, better reasoning, and open democratic practices that can lead to community sustainability and also stability. In, all, in, in an all boats uh, can rise approach, these sorts of good humanistic terms and concepts can work well across the country at this time. I'm hoping this can lead to carrying innovative ideas to, in how to negotiate peace at the international level. Thank you. Um, so to go one more time into my, uh, I, I'm going to have to, unfortunately, it's, I've been talking about it for six months now, I have to really make a big push that there has to be a talk about exuberance for, for open policy practices. You guys talk about things in terms of privacy policy. I'm really, I'm going to really stress the term open public policy. Uh, it has to be talked about, and it has to be fun. <laughs> it's a fun subject, and it's growing. Uh, ALPR use, uh, you know, the civil rights and civil protections and data collection, it's, 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 it's the number of days is really shrinking. That's from good practices. People are having fun with it. And I, and I just hope, you know, to, to state uh, Dolan Beckel uh, on his awards uh, resume, that you know, it, why can't we? Why can't open public policy and uh, you know accountability be a part of that list? Why is that so difficult here in San Jose? I uh, hope we can work on it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned.